everyone. I think we're going to get started. I think we'll get started. Please take your seats. All right. Yes? OK, we are live now, so we're going to get started. Thank you so much for being here today, and welcome to the Center for Global Development. It's an honor and privilege to host this day-long seminar in honor of the work and accomplishments of Michael R. Reich. My name is Amanda Glassman. I'm the Executive Vice President and a Senior Fellow here at CGD. We are an independent, not-for-profit think tank. Our aim is to improve global health, reduce global poverty, and improve lives through innovative economic research. And to fulfill this mission and to deliver on everything that we talk about in global health, you know, understanding how politics and policy intersect, how they do or do not have an impact on outcomes is absolutely critical, and there are few political scientists who have made it their life's work to understand and indeed practice the use of real-time political analysis to improve outcomes. And one of those few, of course, is the Taro Takimi Professor of International Health Policy, Emeritus Michael Reich. So this event today brings together a community of his colleagues, his former students and mentees, and other prominent public health and policy scholars to celebrate and reflect on the contributions of Michael to literature, research, teaching, mentoring, and just being an overall amazing human being that we've all had the privilege to work with. To those who might be less familiar with Michael's work because you're joining online um, or you're, you've, you've joined because you're interested in the topic, here is a brief summary. His research, writing, and teaching over the past half century have significantly contributed to our understanding of the political economy, of public health, health reform, and other domains of public policy. If you've ever taken a class with Michael and he explains a reform to you, you're like, what were those people thinking? And why didn't they ask Michael first? <laughs> He's really considered the founder of applied political analysis in global health, his work has influenced health reforms, policy implementation in many domains, and shaped the very highest levels of policy making, including at G7 summits. And we have uh, a representative of Japan here today who's leading this G7 process. And through his teaching and mentoring, he's inspired students and practitioners, many of which are now in very important leadership roles, including ministers of health, senior officials in multilateral institutions, and others. Um, his work is the basis of current research for scholars around the world on health reform, on political economy, pharmaceutical policy, and so many other areas. And although I would certainly like, and, and we could fill today with anecdotes and stories about working with Michael, and Michael as a, just an amazing person, we've instead decided to focus on how his contributions address the public challenges, public health challenges of today and tomorrow. We've centered the day around three panels that each covers a key topic of Michael's contributions in the area of applied political analysis in public health. We'll kick off with health reform, we'll follow with political economy in the policy process, and we'll finish with access to medicines. The panel moderators will focus on lessons learned from Michael's work and identify strategies to address future challenges in these areas. A keynote session will kick everything off, um, and then we'll finish the panels with a presentation of a celebratory video and a memory book. So um, each of the people who will speak today has had a really important role in Michael's life, either as a boss, a mentor, a colleague, a friend, a mentee, and we're going to start with some recorded remarks from two important mentors and bosses of Michael. Um, we have Harvey Feinberg, 
uh, who was the former dean of the Harvard School of Public Health and president of the Institute of Medicine, and Professor Peter Timmer. And remarks by Peter Timmer will be read by Ken Silverman, as Peter, unfortunately, is unable to join. Those remarks will be followed by uh, the president of the University of Miami, Julio Frank, and also sometime affiliate of the Harvard School of Public Health, and Michael's very close friend and colleague, the Honorable Keizo Takemi, member of the Japanese Parliament. We'll hear from many of Michael's mentees, uh, including Veronica Wurtz. Um, I do want to say a couple words about the, the junta that organized this event in consultation with Michael, Veronica, uh, Jesse Bump from Harvard, and Prashant Yadav here at the Center for Global Development. So let's get started, and we'll begin with Harvey's recorded remarks. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. Uh, this is actually me remotely, live, not recorded. But I'm very happy to be with you, and especially pleased to be part of this opening panel with uh, my dear friends and colleagues, Keizo Takami, Julio Frank, Veronica Wirtz, and I know we'll hear from Peter Timmer as well. And especially uh, to be joined with you, Michael, our dear friend and colleague, whose career-long achievements uh, we celebrate today. Rudolf Virchow, the father of modern pathology, famously observed that medicine is a social science and politics is nothing else but medicine on a large scale. In this light, one might imagine that political science would play a prominent part in schools of public health from the outset, but that was not the case. A century ago, when schools of public health emerged from roots in sanitary engineering and microbiology, uh, political science was not uh, part of the curriculum. The curriculum derived mainly from sanitary engineering and microbiology, plus vital statistics, demography, and health administration. This latter tended to focus on institutional leadership and also on public health functions, mainly at the local and state levels. Over the decades, formal instruction in such fields as epidemiology, biostatistics, nutrition, environmental sciences, and behavioral sciences were introduced uh, from time to time in various schools. It was not until the 1970s that the first Department of Health Policy and Management was established in the School of Public Health by then Dean Howard Hyatt at Harvard. Dean Hyatt was a champion of interdisciplinary approaches to health, uh, and he had a global outlook. Through a chance encounter, he found common ground with the renowned physician leader, Dr. Taro Takami of Japan. Dr. Takami led the Japan Medical Association for decades, and during the mid-1970s, served as president of the World Medical Association. Both doctors, Takami and Hyatt, appreciated the profound need for global leadership in health, especially in less economically developed countries. With Dr. Takami's full support and encouragement, Dean Hyatt established in 1983 a new fellowship program for rising leaders in global health, known from the outset as the Takami Program in International Health. Michael Reich was ideally prepared and positioned to take up leadership responsibilities for the Takami Program. As a recently minted PhD in political science from Yale, uh, you could tell it was Yale from his pension for bow ties. Uh, Michael came to Harvard in 1981 as a postdoctoral fellow in the interdisciplinary programs in health. A decade earlier, he had spent a few years at the Keio University School of Medicine in Tokyo, where his interests in environmental pollution and comparative health systems began to ripen along with his lifelong affection for the culture, language, and people of Japan. These interests are reflected in Michael's early work in the 1970s on the environmental crisis in Japan 
and comparison of health and medicine between Japan and the United States. Just as the Takami program was taking shape, Michael signed on as assistant director in 1983 and was appointed executive director in 1984. I became dean in the summer of 1984, and that fall, we welcomed the first group of five Takemi Fellows. Michael has pursued many different interests in health systems and global health over the years. He has served in various leadership positions in academic departments and centers, but his connection to the Takemi program never wavered. In 1988, he took on the title of program director, and he was appointed the Taro Takami Professor of International Health Policy in 1997. This year marks the 40th anniversary of the Takami program. I'm so pleased to see among the audience today that Keizo Takami has joined us in this celebratory program. An eminent figure in his own right Keizo has matured along with the rest of us, observing and admiring Michael's leadership of the program named in honor of his father. Michael's career-long contributions in advancing health in Japan and global health were recognized in 2015 when the government of Japan conferred on Michael the Order of the Rising Sun, a high distinction indeed. Michael has directly impacted the lives and careers of the Takemi Fellows, but his influence as a teacher and mentor extends far beyond. Michael's excellence in teaching has been recognized by his students and peers. And as Dean, I was subject to the occasional Reich, Reich lecture and instruction as well. Uh, I've always learned a lot from Michael. Just now, I'm speaking to you from Berlin. And a couple of weeks ago, I had the occasion to visit with the Minister of Health in Germany, Karl Alterbach, a former student of Michael's, who views his time at Harvard as the formative years of his professional career. The same influence and gratitude would be expressed by countless graduates in cities around the world. Michael's intellectual contributions to health policy and health systems research were recognized in 2016 at the fourth Global Symposium on Health Systems Research by the inaugural award for lifetime service in the field of health policy and systems research. Particularly noteworthy in this domain is the landmark work on Getting Health Reform Right, a guide to improving performance and equity that Michael co-authored with Mark Roberts, Bill Schall, and Peter Berman. Originally published in 2004 and reissued in 2019, this work continues to be a vital resource for health reform in countries around the world. As an exemplary academic citizen, a dedicated teacher, an intellectual leader, a bridge builder across cultures and peoples, Michael Reich has consistently brought out the best in his students, colleagues, collaborators, and I might add, deans. As a political scientist, Michael has found in public health a way to practice medicine on a large scale. Through his intellectual and human legacies, Michael is making the world a healthier and a better place. Thank you, Michael for all you have done and all you continue to do. And thank you everyone for being part of this celebratory program in tribute to our dear friend, colleague and teacher, Professor Michael Reich. Good morning. Um, so 
Before I have the distinguished uh, honor to read Peter Timmer's excellent remarks, um, since I have all of your attention, uh, I thought it would be irresponsible of me if I didn't first put on my Ken Silverman chapeau uh, to personally thank Michael um, for not only being a pillar of excellence, a voice of reason, a caring and welcoming cousin, uh, but also and especially uh, for helping to convince my Japanese grandparents in Fukushima uh, that they should take a chance on blessing the union between my Japanese mother and Jewish father. Uh, and just to situate the historical context, this was back in the 70s, uh, barely a decade after Loving versus Virginia, so interracial unions were still a highly novel, if not controversial idea. Um, and so I arguably owe my very existence uh, to yet another facet of Michael's many and enduring pioneering efforts, and I just wanted to first personally thank him for that. So, thank you, Michael. Okay, now I will put on my Peter Timmer chapeau, uh, and it's an honor uh, to read uh, his remarks for you today. Uh, so his remarks are entitled, Michael Reich, The Early Years at the Harvard Business School with Peter Timmer. Michael Reich and I have known each other for over 40 years. We met in the summer of 1982 when I was a professor at the Harvard Business School, and Michael was inquiring about the possibility of working with me as a postdoc. I had moved from the Department of Nutrition at Harvard School of Public Health in 1980 after it became clear that my interests in food policy and, and agricultural development were not a good fit for what was still a fairly traditional school of public health. With President Bach's blessing and Dean Howard Hyatt's permission, I moved to the newly created John D. Black Chair in Agriculture and Business at Harvard Business School. In 1981 to 1982, uh, Michael was a research fellow at HSPH in the Interdisciplinary Program in Health. He wanted to stay at Harvard and maintain his links to HSPH, but needed a new base. I had never worked with a postdoc before, but uh, HBS, Harvard Business School, uh, had ample research funds and approved my request for one. Michael was immediately a significant force in my academic life. He brought two distinct perspectives that had not been factors in my own academic work, state-of-the-art training in political science, a deep immersion in the science and politics of the public health disaster in Japan that formed the basis of his PhD uh, thesis at Yale, and the widely acclaimed book, Toxic Politics. We, click, we quickly were asked to join a research project getting underway at HBS under the leadership of Professor uh, Tom McCraw, the distinguished business historian. Uh, Tom served as research director and editor of America versus Japan, published in 1986. It was a massive research project with extensive funding for field research. Michael and I, along with Yasuo Endo, a senior official in the Japanese Agricultural Ministry who was spending uh, 1982 to 83 at the US-Japan program, made several trips to Japan to understand the economic and political stresses induced by a rapidly changing economy. Our chapter, Agriculture, the Political Economy of Structural Change, started my academic work in two fields new to me, the political economy of agricultural development and food policy, and the in-depth analysis of structural transformation. I am now more identified professionally with these two fields than with my early specialization in the economics of food consumption and nutrition, and the estimation of frontier production functions, the topic of my own PhD thesis. The field research with Michael was a real eye-opener. I had traveled a bit with the family in Japan in the early 1970s uh, and visited many temples and shrines in, in uh, Kyoto and Nara, but I never visited farms, agricultural co-ops, a real force in Japan, food processing facilities, supermarkets, or government offices. Visits set up by Yasuo Endo were especially productive. But I was totally dependent on Michael to translate what was going on, and even more importantly, to make sense of it all. Michael made sure our work was visible in Japanese academic and policy circles, and I received many invitations to lecture in Japanese universities and think tanks. The insights from these interactions helped me to understand Japan's reluctance to sell its surplus 
WTO rice in 2008 during the raging world rice crisis, despite urging from the U.S. government to do so. Eventually, Japan did offer to sell several hundred thousand tons of high-quality long-grain rice to the Philippines. And the day the Prime Minister made the offer on national television, uh, world, pri world rice prices started to decline dramatically. The speculative bubble that had rapidly inflated rice prices had been pricked and they quickly returned to normal. The world has not forgotten Japan's important role in helping to stabilize the world rice market at a very difficult time, even though Japan never sold any of its surplus rice. So once Michael returned uh, to HSPH after the HBS postdoc, he proceeded to make himself indispensable to the development of its programs in international health especially via his links to the Takemi program. His career path within HSPH was quite unconventional, unconventional excuse me, but there was no arguing with success. Michael's prowess as a teacher and mentor is reflected in these proceedings, but they also built demand for his services inside HSPH. Despite his unconventional path, Michael was put on a tenure track appointment. And when the time came, I was delighted to be asked by Harvard's president to chair the Tenure Review Committee. These are never slam dunks, but Michael's record more or less stood on its own. That one was easy. Over the past three decades, our academic interests have diverged, but we remain good friends. And with that thought, I close on a congratulatory note. I cannot think of another Harvard professor who could have assembled such a distinguished list of attendees. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be part of this celebration, which honors the trajectory of one of the most original and influential thinkers in global health of my generation. I have witnessed Michael's journey over a period of almost 40 years for two reasons. The first is that I have a close association with the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, where Michael developed his professional career. The second reason is that Michael has a longstanding and strong relationship with Mexico, the country where I was born and where I have developed most of my own professional work. So our paths have crossed on multiple occasions. I witnessed Michael's early efforts to introduce political analysis in the public health community and personally benefited from the initial ideas of what eventually became policymaker. I saw him brilliantly lead the Takemi program in international health for years and collaborated with him on the first edition of the Harvard Ministerial Leadership Program inspired by Professor Adetokumbo Lucas. And I have followed his close relationship with Mexico, where he spent two terms as visiting professor at the National Institute of Public Health, and where he has been teaching a popular two-week Harvard field course. It all started in 1984, when Dean Harvey Feinberg, who you just heard from, generously opened the doors of the Harvard School of Public Health to the nascent National Institute of Public Health of Mexico which I was honored to establish and direct. Michael had recently joined the school faculty. A few years later, from 1982 to 1993, I spent a sabbatical year at the same school. So I was able to follow and admire Michael's efforts to introduce the political dimension in discussions of national health policies. He had identified an important void in the global health agenda, agenda and was determined to fill it. Michael was the prescient and preeminent pioneer, sorry for the alliteration, uh, the prescient and preeminent pioneer of political analysis <laughs> of health systems reforms in developing countries. When I returned to Mexico, I used his ideas on political mapping to develop a set of policy alternatives to improve the performance of the Mexican health system. It was in those years, during a leadership course for ministers of health of Latin America that was jointly organized by the Harvard School of Public Health and the Mexican Health Foundation, that I encountered for the first time for me, 
a clarifying concept that public policies have three legs, technical, ethical, and political. I heard it in a class delivered by Michael in that leadership course, and I had quoted him dozens of times literally since then. When I was appointed Minister of Health of Mexico in the year 2000, Amanda, I did listen to Michael. <laughs> so when I was appointed a minister in 2000, I used this concept of the three legs to develop the framework for the national policy health, health policy document of the six-year administration, the title of which was the democratization of health. I also used it in the design and implementation of the comprehensive reform that was carried out then, whose main compo component was a public insurance scheme called Seguro Popular. And we deliberately, and Eduardo Gonzalez Pierre, who was part of that, we remember, I said we need to take a, pay attention to the technical pillar, the ethical pillar, and the political. And then you build the political pillar. It was an explicit component. Shortly after, uh, Michael, uh, Mark Roberts, Bill Shaw, and Peter Berman, as you've heard, published the seminal book, Getting Health Reform Right, which com continues to be the indispensable reference on the topic. Since no good deed goes unpunished, I'm talking about Harvey's good deed, I eventually became dean of the Harvard School of Public Health, now the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I then got to know in detail the TACIMI program in international health. We cannot overestimate the value of this program, which has brought together in a period of now almost 40 years, or 40 years, hundreds of influential researchers and decision makers from all over the world. Among other things, Michael's outstanding command of Japanese helped him establish a sustainable relationship with Japan and the sponsors of this successful program led by Keizo Takemi, who's here today. Now it is his command of Spanish that has allowed Michael to run for the past 10 years the Harvard field course on the Mexican health system that I mentioned earlier. Michael has gotten to know almost everybody in the health policy arena in Mexico. In fact, I would argue that nobody outside Mexico knows the Mexican health system as well as Michael does. And he knows it at all levels because his courses have included excursions to indigenous communities in Chiapas, discussions with directors of private hospitals in Mexico City, visits to rural clinics managed by global NGOs, debates with researchers, and conversations with almost all of the past six ministers of health of Mexico. Major changes have taken place in the past four years in the health arena in Mexico and Michael was the first one to document them in his paper, Restructuring Health Reform Mexican Style. This paper stals, starts with a sentence that summarizes Michael's thinking. It is a statement that will ve very probably be turned into a mantra, and I quote him. Health reforms are constructed through politics, but they are also dismantled and restructured through politics. Michael Reich was able to fill a void in global public health. He filled it in a thoughtful and imaginative way through the development of ideas, instruments, and networks that have earned him guru status in the global health community of the 21st century. In addition, his intellectual contributions have had major practical consequences in many countries, including mine. This is very easy to say, but extremely uncommon. Very few scholars can pride themselves on developing original ideas that translate into policies, programs, and practices. Michael has been a masterful connector between ideas and action. This is, I believe, the reason why we are all here today celebrating the enduring legacy of Michael Reich. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I'm so delighted having this wonderful occasion to talk about my good friend, the Michael Reich. Harvey and Rio has already spoken by about the Takemi program. It was happened the 40 years ago. Uh, the, my, the late father, uh, just contributed uh, to establish the new program in international health at the Harvard School of Public Health. And Michael, the firstly nominated as assistant director, and we knew each other. So nearly 40 years. And then he succeeded the professorship of the Taro Takemi, my father's name, after the, my good friend, the Lin Kan Chen. Can you imagine that somebody has a title with my father's name? He works for uh, Japan Medical Association as a president for more than 25 years, just like uh, Hoover of FBI. Very typical Japanese father. <laughs> so sometimes when I listened the voice of the Michael, I got a headache. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Michael, groundbreaking research, innovative teaching, and tireless advocacy have significantly advanced the field of public health and his pioneering work on the political determinants of health has a greatly enhanced our understanding of the complex interplay between the politics and public health. And his insights have guided policymakers and practitioners around the world, of course, including myself. This event will bring together a community of scholars and practitioners in the field of political science and public health. It's an opportunity for us to reflect on the past, acknowledge the present, and discuss the challenge that lie ahead. Through our discussions and exchange of ideas, we hope to deepen our understanding of the complex and dynamics, the relationship between the politics and the public health. Therefore, at the heart of our discussion today is a recognition that the politics and policies play a crucial role in shaping public health outcomes. We must continue to engage with policymakers and stakeholders and communities to develop the evidence-based policies that promote health equity and address the underlying the social, economic, and the political determinants of health. What the Michael done is a really good, good example for it. He played a vital, vital role in uh, shaping Japan's the global health agenda, as well as the global discussion, particularly through his involvement in the 2008 G8 Toyako Summit and the 2016 G7 Iseshima Summit, and the upcoming 2023 G7 Hiroshima Summit, which will take place in the end of this month. At the G8 Toyako Summit in 2008, Michael was a key advisor to the Japanese government, providing critical insight into the political determinants of health and advocating for policies that prioritize the health equity and social justice, which in the past was dominated by the disease-oriented disease uh, specified the vertical approach to shed rights on the great importance of horizontal health systems approach. His contributions were instrumental in shaping the final outcome of the summit itself which resulted in a renewed commitment to global health and a focus on a strengthening health systems in the low- and middle-income countries. At the G7 Isashima Summit in 2016, Michael continued to advocate for policies that prioritize health equity and social justice, particularly in the context of the Sustainable Development Goal, as you know, 
that the uh, SDGs has the universal health coverage as a one of the important targets. And this has was just happened uh, right after the uh, Ebola outbreak. So his work helped ensure that health remained the key, pri key priority in the global health among the G7. And the G7 adopted the Isashima, G7 Isashima vision for global health, which is consists of the three pillars. The first, achieving the universal health coverage. The second, the crisis management system building because of the Ebra outbreak experience at that time. The third, the cope with the silent pandemic on the antimicrobial resistance, AMR. And now, we will be the host of the G7 under the, such a very difficult uh, period. We are now facing very serious the geopolitical the conflicts. And uh, the such a circumstances, the role of the politics and policies on the public health becomes much more important in a various aspect. We have to make every effort to collaborate each other beyond the national boundaries. And we have to widen the space of peace. Finally, once again, I want to emphasize my the great confidence that the Michael Reich legacy will continue to inspire the future generations of scholars and practitioners to push the boundary of knowledge and the boundaries of the, those the national the interest and seek new ways to pro promote the public health. We hope that this event will be a source of inspiring and motivation for all of us to continue to work towards the healthier, more equitable, and a peaceful world. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be one of the keynote speakers today, and I would like to thank Amanda Glassman and her team for hosting us today. Many, many years ago, Michael Reich taught a session on political analysis at the Mexican National Institute of Public Health, where I spent the first 10 years of my career uh, and where I met Michael. He started by asking the audience how to define politics. Many of you probably have heard Michael Reich asking this question. Many in the audience offered their own definition some very sophisticated, some quite long. And when everybody had finished, he smiled and he said, said something to the effect, I like short, simple definitions that including my mother can understand. So at that stage, he offered the definition, politics is who, who gets what, when, and how by the political scientist, Harold Laswell. So as someone who has known Michael for just about 18 years, not 30, 40, 50 years as some of the other keynote speakers today, I thought I'd better follow that advice and create something very short and simple as instructions for this event. And this goes by the acronym CGD, because it's the name of the center and it's so easy to remember. <laughs> so I explain um, what um, each uh, letter stands for in very simple terms that also Michael's mother can follow. So let's start. C stands for celebrate. Celebrate with us the contributions of Michael Reich um, to literature, research, teaching, and mentoring, and we will do that, as Amanda explained, through the three panels that we will have, one on health reform, the other on political economy, and the other on pharmaceutical policy, and these are the three main areas where Michael has made outstanding contributions. And then the G. The G stands for gather. 
we have, with the help and the significant help of, of Michael, invited over 150 people, those who have interacted and worked with Michael for the past 50 years in the field. Um, some have, um, and we have then extended that invitation also via the CGB website to others who have not met Michael, Michael Reich, but are interested in his work or even those um, just interested in the field and who want to listen in. So we have about, I would say, probably 80, 90 people here in the room, but we have probably an equal number outside, which we unfortunately can't see at the moment, but we have prepared something which hopefully we can make everybody kind of visible and bring the audience externally and internally together. So for that, I would like to ask you just pull out your cell phone, just scan the link if you could. Um, that would help us so that you can connect and probably by doing so, you will be connected to that slide of my slideshow that I'm just seeing. I see some nods already in the room. You will probably see now the QR code on your screen. Does this seem to be the case? The limit has been exceeded. <laughs> limit has been exceeded. Oops, that's great. So let's, let's try out if we can at least have some of you answer this question. Does this show up? We have just one. That's not so good, I would say. That's not so good. Um, maybe let's do one test more and let's um, uh, see if the technician can do us a favor to just wipe out and let's do one more and see of now, I think we have more connected. Is someone able to answer some of the questions? Not really. <laughs> I hope not. I hope, I see some also connecting from outside. Let's see if some can connect as well. Yes, some hearts of them. Okay, <laughs> we have. We have many connected from Western Pacific. We have many connected probably from Southeast Asia. We can't see them. But let's perhaps go then to the next one. For some in the room, you might be able to answer and maybe show just with the show of your hands who is in the room who is a colleague of Michael. Just for here, for now, in the room. And I see some can also answer online. That's wonderful. Yes, we have a good number. Let's see who, is t who was, um, Michael is a teacher of. Let's quickly a show of hands. I see a lot of people here in the room. Michael was a teacher of. Mentor and advisor. Who? Ha yes, wow. We have Boss, have, do we have anyone? <laughs> mentees, who are Michael's mentees? Yes, we have a good crowd here. Do we have family members in the room? Thank you so much. And Les, let's give them a big applause. Thank you so much for being here today with us and celebrating. Um, so we have obviously also others interested. Sorry, it didn't work out exactly as I planned, but nevertheless, we had a good, I think, a good fun, and you can laugh about me. This one uh, was meant to be a word cloud. Maybe at some point we can test it. Maybe we can test it if we exceed the limits. At some point we, we can do it perhaps uh, even today when I try to bounce this up to just more than eight. We have obviously more eight than eight people in the room. Okay, um, but now I would like to move on and obviously introduce you to the last, to the last letter that we have in this, in this instructions for today. And the last letter is discover. Discover new insights in addressing today's challenges in political and policy analysis and public health based on Michael Zweig's work. I would argue that the significance of the work of any writer, teacher, mentor, including Michael Zweig's work, lies in the fact that it lets us discover new insights, not only in the moment when a book is written or a paper is published, but it creates new insights over time that have relevance today and tomorrow. And certainly this event is an opportunity to do so. We have the panel instructors who we have asked to help us summarizing these new insights. Susan Sparks with the panel, Jesse Bump, and Prashant Yadav. And they will help us summarizing these new insights. But I would also like to ask that you help us summarizing these insights from each of the panels. And for that, we have in the program created a QR code. One QR code in the program you can use to upload not only videos and photos, but also you can upload there a short text. And we would like to ask you to do so. 
Upload a short text of an insight that you take from the state. I have done the so now this if I, if I um, am an organizing member, which obviously I should go uh, with a good example. Mm -hmm. And so I have done this. I have done and summarized an insight. I have not, uh, have not uploaded that yet, but uh, I will do that in a short while. And my message um, that I have as an insight from my work with Michael is um, thank you for creating authentic connections in public health. Relations based on generosity, mutual respect, the desire to be supportive and listen deeply. The connections feel genuine and congruent and enable us to be our best selves. I would argue that one can only teach and mentor effectively when one creates these authentic connections. Despite teaching and mentoring being so shamefully undervalued in academia, including public health, Michael Weiss chose both as part of his most outstanding contributions within his field. And because of that, the creation of authentic connections. The community gathered here today is abundant evidence of Michael Weiss' ability to create long-lasting, authentic connections, not only through the Takemi program, not only a few here and there, but hundreds, literally hundreds of connections forming a public health community. Moreover, I believe that also Michael Rice's writing, ideas, and knowledge generation in the field of applied political science and public health and public policies are outstanding by themselves. They would be short-lived if we, they would remain in books, if they would remain in papers and reports. It is through the authentic connections with one another that we are able to implement those ideas and insights along our own and to address today's and tomorrow's public health challenges. So I hope you all enjoy with me today this special event with the instructions CGD. Celebrate Michael Reich's <coughs> important contribution, gather with friends and colleagues, and discover during this event new and authentic connections that will bridge into the future. Thank you. We will be joined by the man of the hour. Go. Uh, so, Amanda, that means I have an hour. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, you know, this is uh, a little bit of an out of body kind of experience for me, and um, uh, emotionally overwhelming at having uh, so many different threads and people of my life together in the same place, um, uh, not to mention all the kind words. Um, so I, I will be brief. Let me first of all thank everyone for this opportunity to speak um, and thank everyone who's contributed to this event, uh, the hosts at CGD, the, the four organizers, the gang of four, uh, Veronica, Amanda, Jesse, and Prashant, and uh, especially everyone who has traveled near and far from, from Japan, from Africa, from Europe, from Mexico, Central America, um, from all over the United States. It's really, it, it is heartwarming in, in a way that one doesn't often have the experience in one's life. It, it, there's a little bit of me which says, is, is, are they really talking about me? <laughs> I mean, is it, <laughs> did I do this stuff? Um, it, and, and it's certainly not something I, I did with the intent of uh, creating this kind of uh, community building event. I'd also like to thank my teachers and mentors um, and uh, those who spoke today, uh, those who are no longer with us uh, on this world, and thanks to my family for all the ways they've supported me uh, and put up with me over over many years. Second, let me assure you, this event was not my idea. Uh, the four co-organizers came up with the idea. Apparently, one of them said, uh, let's do this while Michael is still alive. <laughs> Th then the person said, 
and let's do it while he's still reasonably coherent. <laughs> Both of those seem to me like a good idea. Um, but it struck me as a, this is an unusual kind of event because it's both what I have written as an author and what I have done as an educator. So it's both dealing with ideas and person, and sometimes more focused ideas, sometimes more focused on person. In an odd way, I'm here both as object and as subject. And my writings exist as texts, as objects, but I'm also here in person to speak as a subject. Um, and I've spent some time trying to prepare for this. How, how do you prepare for being both object and subject and thinking about similar situations? And I kept coming back to this idea. It's a little like being at your own funeral. And, and that reminded me of the classic scene in American literature. Usually I would stop here and say, okay, what is that classic scene? <laughs> Um, but when Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn, and Joe Harper hid at their own funeral in, Tom so in, in Mark Twain's book, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, and listened to the sermon in their honor because they were presumed dead. So I reread those chapters. Actually, I got a copy of the book and reread the whole book um, to prepare for today. Actually, many of the adventures in the book remind me a little bit of the School of Public Health. <laughs> and Twain, Twain reminds us that there are many ways to reflect on the past. And I quote, the clergy from the funeral, the clergyman drew such, pi such pictures of the graces, the winning ways, and the rare promise of the lost lads that every soul there, thinking he recognized these pictures, felt a pang in remembering that he had persistently blinded himself to them always before and, and had as persistently seen only faults and flaws in the poor boys. Everyone in attendance at the funeral ended up, quote, in a chorus of anguished sobs. <laughs> um, I hope that doesn't happen today. Until the three boys left their hiding place in the gallery and walked down the center aisle to the shock and acclaim of all in attendance who thought the three boys had already departed this world. Uh, in fact, I was at a recent meeting and someone came up to me and said, oh, I see we're still vertical. <laughs> so this fictional scene is a reminder of caution in reflecting on the past, and part of today is about reflecting on the past, and the different interpretations that can be told. As today unfolds, I appreciate the kind words of the speakers, but I also hope that we don't forget the faults and flaws that Twain reminds us of. In a real sense, I'm both deeply honored by the event today and acute, acutely embarrassed to be here. As I reflect back on my past 50 years, and in some ways it's hard to believe it's been 50 years since I first set foot in Japan in July 1971. I'm aware of things I have not done, questions that I have not adequately answered, problems that exist in my papers and books, things that I could have done better. With that caution, let's get on with the discussions. You can try to forget that I'm sitting here um, I, I really will be quiet until my end of the day when I have another five minutes to have some additional <laughs> reflections. Actually, the people who were really my students will hear me throughout the day speaking in their heads. <laughs> and then the, in the next sessions, let's think together about how to move forward in the fields that I've explored and tilled and the puzzles that I've tried to explain over the past half century. There's still much to do, and thank you, one and all. Okay. So thank you so much, Michael. And to recover from that, we'll have a brief break and then come back here for the first panel. Thank you.
we're going to get started in just a few minutes. If you could find your seats, please. If you could all find your seats, please. Thanks so much. Everyone, a sincere plea to please come back and settle down. We are ready to start our next panel session. OK, so the next part of the agenda is we are going to have two panel sessions. The first one is moderated by Susan Sparks. And then the second one will be led by students of Michael. Um, you all may know Susan, but just a quick introduction. She's a health financing officer at the World Health Organization. She's a health economist, has worked extensively on health financing and fiscal space across a range of countries, uh, has been at the World Bank, the Global Fund, um, and is a, doctor, she's a doctorate at the Harvard School of Public Health uh, in health economics. So I will hand over to Susan for introducing the, the panelists for her session. Thank you, Prashant. Uh, thank you, everyone. So uh, I'm really thrilled to be here. I fall into the Michael as I'm a mentee of Michael's. Um, and I'll note that Michael is not back here yet. So <laughs> I'll take that opportunity to. Um, but uh, I'm really pleased to, to kick off this next part of the day, um, which the, we had the wonderful reflections of the morning. And now we're, we're really turning into the, the topical areas um, related to Michael's work. And, and I'd like to start by saying any of us who have walked into Michael's office or had a phone call with Michael where we think we have a brilliant idea and we have all these thoughts and then we walk out of the office um, with a very different sort of ideas, different sort of research questions, 
but always much clearer and, and much more um, with conceptual clarity, with an idea on how to move forward. And he has a remarkable art of really crafting that constructive criticism. Um, but I think for all of us here, it's our job to now uh, show that the mentorship is paid off in terms of our own conceptual clarity and, and how we approach these ideas. And so this panel is focusing on, are we getting health reform right? Um, the need for evidence generation and training in public health for a, of public health practitioners and researchers. So I think this, this is a lot. Um, and so following on Michael's examples, I think there are two key topics that are covered by this panel. Uh, the first relates to what, what Julio Frank touched on, Michael's role of really leading through example of focusing on what are the linkages between evidence generation, data, training, and not just training in an academic sense, but training in a practical sense, reaching out to policymakers, decision makers. Um, and then how does that training link ultimately to practice, to policy making, to decision making? Um, and then the second part really has to do with the, the role of frameworks and the flagship approach, the getting health reform right, um, that I have my green book here um, that is well worn. And I'd also like to note that I keep in it a, uh, a, an email that I received from, from Mark Roberts um, that is a two page um, piece on the role of theory in <laughs> research questions. Um, but I'd also like to pay tribute to, to, Mike, or to Mark as a, as a real um, intellectual sparring collaborator and partner of Michael's and, and all of ours as well. Um, but as part of this, we'll be reflecting on what is the role of frameworks? Why are we all disciples of, of Michael's thinking around what is the independent variable? What are the dependent variables? What is the real question we're looking at? Why does it matter to start health reform with thinking about problems what are root causes? What are the policy levers or control knobs? Um, what are the political, ethical, not just considerations, but what are the strategies? How to move this process forward and then thinking about evaluation. And so uh, through this panel of really illustrious uh, speakers that I'm thrilled to have here today, we'll be both reflecting on the, the current practice, on the, on the evidence, on the I guess 20, 30, however many plus years of experience and learning, um, but also really trying to think about what's the agenda moving forward in terms of health reform, in terms of what is needed for evidence generation and training of public health practitioners um, for all of us as we continue our work, but also the next generation who will be entering this field. So with that, I will, um, I will introduce our wonderful speakers. Um, who really wear the multiple hats that, um, that we've all been talking about, whether it's practitioners, researchers, decision makers. Um, so I will start with the introduction of Professor Winnie Yip, who's joining us remotely. Um, and so Professor Winnie Yip is the professor of practice of global health and economics in the Department of Global Health and Population at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And she's also the faculty director of Harvard's China Health Partnership. And then we have Rifat Hassan, who's a lead health specialist in the health, nutrition, and population global health practice um, at the World Bank, a global practice at the World Bank. Uh, and note that I'm not reading the full bios, but I know they're, they're prepared in the, in the um, participant material. So please, um, I, I ask you to, to look for those details there. And then we have Martin Lejoux. He's a professor at the National Institute of Public Health of Mexico and an associate researcher of epidemiology and public health at the French Institute of Medical Research. And then Mohamed Pate, uh, who's the Julio Frank Professor of Practice of Public Health Leadership at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, but also I think has worn the most hats, figuratively and literally, potentially, um, as the former director for health, nutrition, and population in the Global Financing Facility um, at the World Bank, as former Minister of Health of Nigeria, and as well as the incoming CEO of the Gavi Vaccine Alliance. So with that, we'll start the conversation. So we're gonna start with an opening round of questions, but then we'll be turning to all of you for additional questions because we really wanna have this as a, as a conversation. So I ask you to be thinking of, of questions um, that you'd like to ask. And, and again, this is really focusing on 
health reform, the role of frameworks, evidence generation, and training. So Winnie, we'll start with you. Um, so in your experience, particularly in your recent years of leading large-scale health systems reform projects, both in India and China, um, what has been the role of frameworks, including the Getting Health Reform Right framework, and the understanding and, and also how you approach um, health systems and, and their reform? Over to you, Winnie. Great, thank you, uh, Susan. Um, um, first of all, I apologize for not being able to come to Washington to celebrate this important event in person uh, with Michael and all of you, but uh, my spirit is with you the whole day and I'll be attending online. Um, to your question, Susan, um, I think frameworks are critically important in health reforms. And in my experience, I'll just summarize a few reasons why. Well, there's no question that health reform is by definition complex. Health systems are by definition complex and dynamic. I think what is the importance of framework is to provide an analytical approach and a way of thinking for decision makers to help them put their arms around some complicated, complex problems to be able to identify what are the priorities, what are the underlying causes, and then leading to what might be solutions. Health reform, I mean, as a framework is also important in a second sense. Framework is the opposite of prescriptions. When we go to countries and try to help decision makers to come up with their reform agenda, we never tell them, you should do this, you should do that because we believe that every country should come up with their own solution by understanding their own problem, their own priority, the institutional context that their reform has to be adapted to. And framework allow them to do that. Framework means that we're not going to tell them that you do this solution. And so this is what I have observed. And I think in that sense, frameworks are empowering. I would use that word. Um, I would say since 1994, when I joined the School of Public Health and starting as early as 1995, um, I have started using the Getting Health Reform Right framework. Some of you call them the flagship framework. Some of you call it the control now framework, but I like to call it as the Getting Health Reform Right framework. Um, and I had the opportunity to try it out in Hong Kong, a small city that I grew up in. And so, and the logical process of starting with asking the decision maker to deliberate, what is the underlying value of their reform is critically important. The Getting Health Reform Right framework goes way beyond technical solution and analysis, incorporating ethical, and political analysis on top of technical analysis. And I would say that even though that reform that we propose did not get implemented, even until today when Hong Kong go back to discuss reform, our report form a central pillar. But I would like to draw on the experience that I have from China. Starting from the late 1990s, China has been debating about reform and then leading to 2009, announcing a grand reform that I think many of you are know, know of. And um, I think that the Getting Health Reform Right framework actually has made a critical difference in that uh, num uh, uh, period of time. We have trained, I would say, hundreds of policymakers at different level. Some of them, when we first trained them, they were junior. Over time, they ascend to senior position. And the kind of thinking that the framework impart of, on them allow them to be able to have a common language, vocabulary, a common framework, and analytical approach. I keep emphasizing this word, analytical, an analytical approach, a way of thinking that eventually leads to the reform solution that they have picked. And we know how many people who were involved in that process were actually trained by the flagship course. And so that takes me to the next point. Um, if framework can be so influential <clears throat> in terms of thinking, then it means that whether a framework is a good framework, 
is important because a bad framework actually can lead to very bad solutions. Um, I have some reflection on um, why the framework was so helpful and powerful in the context of China was China actually created implicitly through our help a community of people in the government and also in the research community who serve as experts for the government on a continuous basis that that community talk with each other, get trained and enriched over time. And that's how influence are being made. Um, I'm gonna reserve my questions for what are some of the future things that one should think about in terms the frame of the framework, but I would leave one point. I think we really need to critically um, form a lot of effort to train more people on the ground because going forward, reforms are going to be locally driven, locally grown, and locally owned. So um, I think I might have used more than my five minutes, so I'm going to limit um, my comments and leave some of the unanswered questions to the Q&A session. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Winnie. Uh, I, I know we're in a, a, a safe space when the, the mantra of frameworks are empowering is something that resonates with all of us. So um, I, I love that tagline. <laughs> um, so, so now over to Rifat. Um, so Rifat, in your role at the World Bank, um, how have you used the Getting Health Reform Right framework um, in terms of bridging the gap between technocrats and policymakers? And so this role of, of training um, and how this framework helps structure that work and that engagement as well. Thank you, Susan, for that question. Uh, maybe I'll just start off by saying that I think frameworks in general uh, can be an effective bridge for, uh, for policy dialogue. And Winnie, you did make a really good point about there are good frameworks and bad frameworks. Uh, and I think no matter what framework it is, there might be some amount of value. But when it comes to health reform specifically, it's really the getting health reform right framework that I have found to be particularly effective. Um, I've used it in my daily work from framing analyses to designing new loan operations with governments and even stock taking during implementation of these projects to make to enable course corrections. Um, it's really stood the test of time uh, and has been really applicable across diverse settings and to, to delve into a very uh, different sets of health challenges in different places. And maybe I'll use three examples, just very practical and recent examples where we've used this. We've used the framework to design a new operation in the state of Tamil Nadu. This was about four years ago, pre-COVID. Uh, and we assessed both reproductive and child health outcomes and uh, NCD outcomes as the starting point. And then we worked backwards to identify what the underlying health system bottlenecks were and the, the potential reform solutions to address them. Um, subsequently, we had an opportunity in a city level engagement in Chennai where we're able to engage more multi-sectorally, and I think that's one of the, the things that the bank should do more of and has the opportunity to do, and this was one of those opportunities, and we were able to use the framework to actually address non-health sector determinants of NCD outcomes, and so we were able to embed uh, interventions within that, again, using the framework as, as the starting point. In Jordan last year, uh, we used the framework to assess NCD outcomes and financial risk protection, uh, to develop a policy note. We were able to then use this policy note to deepen uh, policy dialogue with both the Ministry of Finance as well as the Ministry of Health, which is now leading to uh, a, a new uh, reform agenda in Jordan. And more recently, we actually partnered with Harvard and with Gates to provide some technical assistance to the state government of West Bengal uh, to do an initial uh, assessment of the health sector. Here also, uh, we used the framework, we were looking at NCDs, we were looking at RCH and financial risk protection as the starting point. And now we're going to be building on that to develop uh, a loan on a set of reforms. And we're going to be incorporating political economy analysis to, to actually make decisions on what reforms actually make it into that packet. So it's very, it's been very practical. It's not only academic, it's not only theoretical, it's actually quite practical. Um, so in these examples, the value of the framework and how to kind of bridge uh, technocrats and policymakers, uh, very clear, the, the value is very clear from two perspectives. One is a technical perspective, and another is a political and process perspective. Um, in terms of the technical perspective, first, 
one of the, the greatest values I find is it really provides a results focus as the starting point, right? Um, and so what, what does this mean? Rather than starting by talking about inputs of the health sector, you really start with what is it that you want to change? What is it that you want to make a difference on? So you start with that result and then you work backwards. Um, rather than starting either with inputs or the latest flavor of the month in global health. Um, so I found that to be very useful. Uh, second, something that Winnie said, it has provided uh, the opportunity to have data and evidence actually feature strongly in the policy dialogue. Now, in reality, it's a combination of data, analysis, guesswork. Uh, um, you're always working with imperfect information, but still, it provides a platform to really do that. Third, it provides a comprehensive structure and flexibility to assess health sector performance, to integrate ideas, and to navigate complexities. The health sector is messy, it's complicated, it's dynamic, it's changing, uh, and it's, I, I find it's very easy to lose your way, uh, either by choosing the flavor of the month or what the latest, uh, the latest intervention is or the, the, the latest uh, uh, thing that some donor wants to actually finance. But the framework has really provided some amount of structure to kind of navigate through those, those, those complexities. So, so then aside from the technical part, it also has brought a lot of value from a political and process perspective. So the political economy analysis is the obvious one, but I think in terms of process, uh, the, the flagship course, um, which is based on the Getting Health Reform Right framework uh, that Harvard and the bank have been working on together for years has been an incredibly effective vehicle for engagement and to bring government counterparts together with bank teams to work together, to brainstorm collectively, uh, and it provides common concepts, common language, common terminology. Um, so not only does the framework have technical rigor and, and provide that conceptual framework, but it also provides an opportunity for joint problem solving, co-development, and, and collective capacity building. The government of Tamil Nadu had actually participated in the flagship course, and that was one of the main reasons why we were able to, to move this forward. So in this way, the process of engagement actually drives alignment uh, and joint ownership uh, around a common set of ideas. Thanks, Rifat. I think um, clear, practical examples, but also shows the importance of um, the process of, of engaging with the framework, but engaging with the concepts, the ideas, and, and that process of, of the co-creation between um, the, different, the different stakeholders, because we're all trained to think in terms of stakeholders. So, <laughs> um, so Martin, um, breaking a bit away from, from frameworks a bit, I think. Um, but wanting to know from your experience in working with large-scale data sets, in particular your recent work in Mexico, um, but also in terms of this evidence generation. And, and I have to say, I did read the reread a bit of the book on the plane here, and it's filled with evidence. I think that's, that's really important here, um, of translating evidence into support of health reform. And, and what do you see as the role of this evidence? And also, how can it be done better? Uh, thank you so much for, for, for the question. So first of all, I want to apologize because I'm not a health systems researcher. I may be actually uh, one of the few car uh, caring epidemiologists in the room, uh, but uh, I have been a, a researcher in public health for almost 20 years uh, in a highly volatile and changing environment for the Mexican health system. And, and really that time, uh, has, uh, has made it absolutely inevitable to ask questions, to try to look uh, for answers, and also to try to contribute. Um, <clears throat> so as I think is an experience with everyone here, it's uh, through asking questions that I, that I, that I actually uh, was uh, um, influenced by, by Michael to start thinking about uh, health systems. It was asking questions that brought us together, that brought us to, to, to have this uh, field course uh, in Mexico, and to start thinking about you know the the, the evidence and how uh, generate that evidence and and what what would be the opportunities. So um, we we in this course we we had the opportunity to talk to a lot of uh, policymakers, researchers, and try to uh, from from their point of view see what was the evidence that was needed to do um, uh, health reform. Um, through that time, uh, 
the, the course has me, give it, given me personally a lot of insights on how the Mexican health system works. And along with, with, with Michael and talking back to, to frameworks, I have been able to use those frameworks also to think about how to bring in um, uh, evidence. Um, so when we're looking uh, for answers, I think we, we, we considered two, or we found two opportunities. One certainly was the use of administrative data sets that are regularly generated in health systems, but I think a of, of, uh, first important one that derived directly from this uh, course was the idea that, um, or, or the recognition that we tend to, to live in professional, organizational, and uh, now, more importantly, ideological silos. So that there is, um, so, that, so we start imagining a place where there could be uh, a protected space for open, calm discussions uh, um, that could be used for development of health policy. So, so we, we, we set up a colloquium. We invited um, uh, people working in the Mexican health system, academics, regulators, uh, consultants, political personnel, and um, several of these individuals we originally met, several of the questions that uh, we, we wanted to address with these individuals, we met in this uh, field course. So, um, so generally speaking, this was a, a closed environment where you know, we, we aimed for diversity, we asked uh, someone to, to, to introduce a topic, and uh, the space was a protected space. So you know, people would come, uh, were free to use the information from the discussion, but uh, we're not allowed to reveal who, who made the comments. It was kind of a, we had a kind of a, you know, the, the, the kind of first rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club. So there was no PowerPoint, no paper trail, but a lot of politically sensitive uh, conversations. So this colloquium felt like this, this place for the generation of ideas where people felt free to talk uh, and engage and generate, uh, start thinking about you know, health policy uh, uh, questions. Um, now, this tied in directly to this opportunity to, to use administrative data. And uh, in the Mexico's, as we were approaching Mexico's change in administration in 2018, we were able to secure or, and transfer uh, a lot of data to the National Institute of Public Health that included uh, reimbursement records for Seguro Popular and uh, the, the Catastrophic Expenditures Fund. So <clears throat> that data uh, has to date been extensively used. And we have been able to answer, I think, key questions on the effectiveness of, 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 of Seguro Popular, like the survival of child, uh, childhood leukemia or the increasing uh, uh, breast cancer treatment coverage. But unfortunately, uh, these analyses come more than a decade late. So I believe an opportunity to provide timely evidence to guide policy and gain the public trust in, in, in Seguro Popular was lost by not recognizing the usefulness of, of these resources. So now that the Mexican health system is being overhauled, I think, um, I think it's, uh, I'm hopeful that, that we can start um, thinking about these past experiences, uh, really the political uh, polarization and the vindictive uh, atmosphere currently in Mexico call for the generation of these safe spaces where we can talk about policy. Um, and also the disappearance of Seguro Popular, uh, I think, makes it uh, uh, very important to start thinking about creative ways in which we can use um, uh, health uh, information systems to answer uh, policy, uh, policy questions, uh, to aid uh, policymakers. And, and not only guide the decisions, but uh, provide support for those policies. So, so I think that um, trying to go back to an original question, how do we find gaps in the evidence creation for health reforms? I think by asking a lot of questions, so. Thank you, yeah, no, I think this, the theme of questions, but also how we intertwine the real political economy around data, around evidence, around 
how we translate that evidence and data into health reform processes which are inherently political and so what that process means and what it looks like. So thank you for that. Um, so now over to, to Mohammed. Um, so based on your, your vast and, and really varied experience, in particular reflecting as, as Minister of Health of, of Nigeria, um, how was the Getting Health Reform Right framework, but frameworks in general in this form of conceptual clarity and, um, and process, how was it used in policy making, but also in trying to push into the next part of, of the, this panel, where do you see opportunities for improvement as well? Over to you. Well, thank you, and let me just thank also CJD for this great event, uh, the Gang of Four uh, for really uh, bringing us. And I think Veronica started with a thank you to Michael. I think Michael, what Veronica presented, actually reflects what many of us think. So Veronica, what you said about Michael, I think it's something that we, I personally deeply feel over the last 23 years in terms of just what I've learned from the flagship course in the course of my work in Nigeria, at the bank, but also even in my most recent term at the bank, I think Michael was very useful in creating that space for me. So thank you uh, for what you've done. So I, I think um, the framework, as was mentioned by Rifat, I think it's a useful tool. Uh, it's a tool for managing an inherently political process. It's one tool among several other tools that policymakers and deciders will have to use. It's an important one. It creates a uh, structure, way of prioritization, and also uh, a language that can be common between those who are trying to propose, but also those who are going to implement reforms. There are a few reflections that I would like to share with, I think, uh, with the audience, and from two country examples perspective. Uh, one question, uh, which is emanating from Zambia, for instance, is how do you teach humility in global health? How do you teach humility in the interface between supranational influences and national policymakers and people at the country level? I'll use the case of example of Zambia as an illustrative one. In the mid-90s, over the several years of efforts to reform the Zambian health system before the Getting Health Reform Right book. I wish it was 10 years earlier. Um, very brilliant economists, health practitioners, donors, supranational actors, lots of resources to design a reform program. If you look at that package, it's almost perfect. And it's still relevant today. But it got derailed over time because the reform team became isolated from the needs of the population. The reform process became very incumbent. The budget of the health sector became more around planning, administration, while outcomes were going down. And in, you recall in the 90s, HIV was ravaging, child mortality up, immunization was going down, maternal mortality was up. But yet there were health reformers. In early 2000, before again the book, a new minister came in place and just flushed it out. And the health reform team, three years later, were all out of the country. Well-trained folks, brilliant economists, but when I went to Zambia in 2003, none of them was in Zambia. Only one was in Zambia. <laughs> because they become sort of very, a cohort that lost this um, sense of humility and also focus on achieving the results, on what are the needs of the actors that you are trying to respond to and became sort of an elite group in that sense. That's sort of one reflection. So in the context of reforming health to improve health system to achieve UHC, how do we teach humility to appreciate what we know and what we don't know? How do we use those tools and the knowledge, the evidence, to actually adapt uh, within the context of countries to manage an inherently complicated political process? That's sort of one. The second country example I'll give is sort of Nigeria. So Nigeria has been going through health reform from 2004. It's almost 20 years of health reform that has been going on. It's a very long-term process uh, from the health policy of 2004 by Eitai Lambo. Many, I served for five years in the federal government and sort of we chaperoned it. So when you're managing a reform process, it's not a project. It's a very long, arduous political process and you have to think about how do you sustain it across different administrations. So the idea started with one administration, it was a third administration that ultimately signed the reform into law and a fourth and fifth one that is implementing it. So how do you build that? How do you teach that in your thinking and the approach that you take? So that you're not just owning it for yourself but actually uh, deliberately building in management of the process across 
the successive periods that are necessary to keep improving. This related lesson uh, from the context of Nigeria is this idea of how do you separate out health sector reform from whole of government reforms? Because reforms are not in isolation. In, uh, so give you a very concrete example. We're fiscally decentralized in Nigeria, uh, which is constitutional. But yet in the health sector, we've decentralized to the ward level, uh, which is much below the local governments in health. But that is further along the administrative structures of government to actually make sense of that. So how do you do that? So some of the re uh, reforms that we did, I mean, at least micro reforms, you might say, is to really bring back local governments uh, w with states under what we call primary health care under one roof policy in 2010 to try to address that because the reform within the sector went further ahead from the whole of government reform where civil servants were, <laughs> there are other reforms that were going on. So how do you manage that process of sectoral reform and broader whole of government reform? A third and final reflection I would say is that this area of, uh, so for what we did in Nigeria, of course we built on the organizational, the financing uh, elements and the behavioral side, uh, less on the payment side and uh, perhaps um, I, I would say much less on the regulatory side. And when I look back now in the last two years, um, I, I think I will say that overall we haven't attended to that aspect more, particularly in the lower income countries the regulatory side. In the context of Nigeria, it took 10 years to get the law, and the regulations are still being developed. The major piece of that reform has, is yet to be uh, really implemented because the regulatory side, the, re the, the regulations, the, how to construct that, I think has not been as attended. And if you, if you step back and you look at uh, national regulators in the context of Africa, 41 of them are at level one. After 20 years, of intense global health effort. They are level one in terms of maturity using the WHO Global Benchmarking Tool. We've not attended to that as much in terms of the institutions in countries to actually exert that. So there are, I think, lessons that we need to sort of uh, think about in terms of moving forward in this era of UHC and uh, how do we reform health systems uh, to respond to people's needs to do that with the humility that is needed, to understand the context, to deliver the results, but also to attend to some of those other learnings that we have had over the years. So thank you for asking me to share some of my thoughts, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mohammed. So yeah, the, the humility part of this, I think, um, is something that we is, is important, but also as we look at UHC indicators, as we look at COVID, as we, as we keep that outcome focus, as the problem focus, I think we see that there's still a lot of work continues and will continue to need to be done in, in this area of health reform and in terms of how we build on the foundations and this, this thinking moving forward. And, and I think this has come up across the panel, this idea of what does it mean for to have sustainable health reform, resilient health reform? Um, what does that, you know, that process look like? And, and I think in terms of this evidence generation, the training and that approach of how we translate these different pieces um, not just in the moment, but, but moving forward is, is critically important. So I'm cognizant of time. I believe I have about, tw we have about 20 minutes. Um, so with that, I want to open it up to, to some questions from, from the audience. And so uh, I think we have microphones, if anybody would like to ask our, our panel. So we have Abdo, please. Uh, Refat, you mentioned application of the framework to NCDs, um, um, critical issue right now. The framework itself, when it was originally developed, and I spent a lot of time teaching it with Michael, uh, has much more of a service delivery dimension, which is much more consistent with communicable disease. Um, with NCDs, so much of the drivers are environmental and behavioral. Um, how are you able to adapt that to Tamil Nadu uh, or other applications? Okay, yeah, please, Amanda. Thank you. Um, I guess I have a question about whether Big Bang health reform is dead. You know, you started working, there was the period of the 1993 World Development Report, the rise of the Big Bang reformers, Julio Frank, Juan Luis Andonio, Etc. And, and indeed, the Nigeria reform was extremely ambitious. 
And now we see backlash to some of that, some politicization. But you know, is it more a question about the margin? And does the framework help at the margin? Or is it about sort of rethinking everything? Great, OK. Yep, one in the back, and then we'll, we'll turn back to the panel. Thank you for the help. Um, thank you. I'd like to ask, um, thank you for the reflections on this framework and um, what we've, what Michael's been um, building the foundation of these frameworks and um, this work. Um, so I would like to ask, like, what's the unfinished agenda that we work on towards um, to build a more resilient health system in the future that um, also not only work in the specific country, but also like it's global setting. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And apologies, I didn't ask you to introduce yourselves as you stood up, but. Uh. Okay. I'm Asti from Indonesia. I'm the recent Michael students from uh, also Martins for the Mexican health system and getting health, uh, doing health reform better, of course. Thank Wonderful. You. Okay. And Amanda, we've already met, and Abdo Yazbek. Uh, yes. Okay, maybe one more and then we'll, we'll turn, please. Thanks, this is um, more of a comment than a question, but Michael was just telling me to make this comment, so. <laughs> 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 um, I'm Anya Geyer, uh, and <laughs> Michael and um, Abril, who we'll talk, hear from later, and Anushka Kalita, and I have been working on a new manual to go along with getting health reform right. Um, I have a few copies. It's a very early draft right now, but we will be sharing it with all of you in the next couple of months um, to get feedback, but it's basically, it's called Practical Guidance for Policymakers and Advisors, and we've tried to sort of encapsulate the practical pieces of the book, Getting Health Reform Right, into a series of steps um, that reformers, people who are thinking about reform, can jump in at various points. Um, and uh, the, it was, I think, initiated through the India Health Systems Project, um, but we're hoping that we'll have relevance for people in lots of other places, too. So I've been taking notes on what everybody's saying in terms of what's practical and helpful. and. Um, yeah, just so that you know that this is, is okay. in process. Thank you, Anya. And I think um, Michael's way of trying to, an trying to keep quiet but also answer some of the questions, <laughs> we, we, we're, we're all well aware. Okay, I'm going to turn to the, the panel. And perhaps maybe we'll start with the, the first question from Abdo. And this, um, I'm going to direct a bit, but please feel free to, to jump in. But I was thinking, Rifat and Martin, this question about adapting frameworks but also the evidence that's needed in terms of health, the emerging health cha uh, challenges that we're facing, um, both your experience in that, but also where you see that agenda moving forward. Please, Rifat. Sure. Uh, I think uh, just very quickly, Anya, my way of practically applying the framework has actually been to call Michael. <laughs> so <laughs> I still don't think that's going to beat my, my uh my strategy, but I'll do on the NCDs question. Uh, I think it's a really good question, and I think that the framework's application is still very relevant because I think the the starting point of what are the NCD outcomes that you're particularly interested in is it hypertension, is it diabetes, is it, is it cancer? The next step is to ask why five times. And so when you ask the why and you do the causal diagnosis, you will end up with non health sector causes, right? So while you can develop a package with the control knobs for what you need to do within the health, health system itself, the diagnosis will actually highlight what are the non-health sector causes or the root causes of these NCD outcomes. So that's what we did in Tamil Nadu. And so we had a set of health sector causes and non-health sector causes. Through the health operation, we were able to address the health sector causes, but we had all of these other things. We're like, oh. We can't look at green spaces, we can't look at behaviors, we can't look at even tax policy. But when some of the other multi-sectoral opportunities came up, we were ready to go, and we knew what were some of the non-health sector causes, and we were able to then input into it. So I think the, the framework and the approach to the framework and the application of the framework does lend itself to not only looking at the health sector, but looking at non-health sector uh, determinants of health sector outcomes. And persuasion, by the way, is one of the uh, control knobs for NCDs 
is both within and outside of the health sector. So I, I think it still is very applicable and relevant to, to assessing NCDs. Great. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> and thinking about the frameworks, I think, uh, I think there's still a lot of work to be done to actually um, show the importance of using them as a policy tool. Uh, what we've seen in the current overhaul of the Mexican health system is an absence of frameworks in the way the reformers are working or using frameworks most, mo mostly as a post, uh, uh, you know, uh, something to refer, to refer to as something that they've already decided on doing, not as a tool, but as something to justify decisions. Uh, this might, I think, uh, seem uh, that we're, pa we're past this, but we're not. We still, I think, need to uh, think about how to present frameworks as useful tools for policymakers, um, for for reform, for reformists also, um, and and think a little bit outside of this, you know, of the space of who are people who often end up doing these reforms. These are people who are, you know, clinician leaders a lot of the times, who really have a very little exposure to to the use of frameworks. So I think. Uh, I think it would be important to start rethinking how we engage with these policy makers and, uh, and uh, show the importance of this uh, uh, framework. Okay, great. So a clear unfinished agenda for all of us to, to take forward. Uh, so, so now the question, I'll, I'll turn to, to Winnie and, and Mohammed and on is Big Bang reform dead? Uh, and um, I'll leave it at that <laughs> and, and turn, maybe Winnie, we can start with you, please. Um, I'll be bold to say no. Uh, I think that Big Bang reform or implemental, incremental change reform, they go in cycles. I think the previous 20 years or so, we have gone through a lot of more Big Bang reform, and I think it is therefore natural that we're now in a phase of going through more smaller changes. And you notice a lot of Big Bang reform actually is also associated with other shocks in the country, including when the country is going through major political change, there's a major economic shock or other kind of shock. Um, I would say that we're actually in a state of reasonably stable time and therefore we are doing moderations and modification but in the future there will be times for big band changes again um, I would even say that um, even in the United States I can see that if you talk to physicians there's such a brewing of discontent and maybe in 10 years, there will be some major change. So I'm actually hopeful that there will be more change so that we can do more foundational reform. Um, and it is in cycle. So I don't think it's that, but we're not in that phase at this moment, probably. Um, I do want to quickly um, respond to that NCD questions. I agree with everything that Rifat has said. Um, but I also want to say that no framework is perfect. No framework can answer all the questions. I think this is where I would borrow um, uh, Mohammed's word, humble. I think we need to be humble to say which framework is for what purpose and for what audience and therefore what it is for. And we need to be combined with some other framework for some of the question that doesn't fall completely with a particular framework. Um, I also want to just quickly talk about what are some of the unfinished agenda. Um, I, I want to repeat again, I hope that in the future, and that goes with the little uh, menu that Anya was holding up is, <clears throat> we want to train a lot more people on the ground who can do this kind of work, rather than always coming back to Harvard, to the World Bank for help. That's the only way influence can take place. And um, on what are some of the other re unfinished reform agenda, uh, uh, agenda of the um, Getting Health Reform Right Framework? Um, I use it a lot and I have a few reflections. I think the framework, there's no question that it is very helpful for all the reasons that is already set. But I don't think we have done enough job to, a good job to really lay out 
how the different parts of the framework and explicitly the five control knob policy lever, how they actually interact with each other and come together. In the framework, they look a little bit like standalone. And I think that we owe the users the further development of how these policy levers interact with each other, how they need to be combined together to have the effect. And that's why when we see in the world, some people who are interested in financing just pick on financing, some other just pick on organization of delivery. But we know in the world that in order to have real reform, it's really a combination of them. And I think that a lot more work needs to be worked on that if we want the framework to be having practical use and also doing justice to the users that we're trying to convince them to use them. And the other missing piece I think that the framework has is, I think that this is sort of subsumed in the organization control knob, but I don't think we're explicit about the whole governance structure of how decisions are being made. Um, I'll stop here, thank you. Thanks, Winnie. Um, that's good to hear that reform, big bang reform is not dead, but we also have a lot of work to do in terms of how we consider some of these, uh, these these complex system dynamics and also good for all of us and, and especially even those who are in master's degrees, PhD programs in terms of research agendas moving forward. So always helpful. So Mohammed, over to you. I, I think as um, Amanda's question, as Michael will also say, is it's a complicated question. Is the era of big reform dead or is there more? I think there's a lot that has happened over the last 20, 30 years in terms of reforming health systems that we can show for. And at the global health level, in terms of the architecture, the platforms, and how we've approached supporting countries, the, you can see there are some uh, important and tangible outcomes. But to be frank, before COVID-19 pandemic, we were off track to achieving the SDGs. We still had a huge unfinished agenda. There's still huge deficits. I think, um, so the need for more um, changing the way we do things is was evident even before the pandemic. The pandemic has made it even more so in the world that we are in today, which has had profound changes uh, that are political, economic, as well as even what we know. And the big bank reforms, in my view, uh, will still be required and is whether we, um, influence them or they happen by some other uh, mechanism what change would have to happen uh, whether it's in global health uh, system or in countries making their own choices how do you manage it I think is to reconcile the uh, sort of more the global sort of uh, health needs and global needs and expectations and priorities with more sort of the local country sort of prioritization and needs of the people of, of, and how to address those and to uh, change the architecture of how we do things and how we support countries from supranational level, but also at the country level, how those national health systems respond to the needs of their own uh, people at the country level. So I would say that it's an imperfect world. It's a very unequal world. A lot of progress has been made, but we have a big agenda still ahead of us and that more changes will be needed as we go forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So how we, yes, please. How we equip ourselves for the future, yes. Please. The framework is decisively important for the political leadership and also the governance. As you may know that the, the nearly the end of the pandemic, now we are thinking the global health governance architecture. In this process, for example, we do realize that uh, we are several global public health goods such as the vaccines and also the uh, you know, therapeutics and also diagnostics. We call it the medical countermeasure. In this process, that the we have uh, so many stakeholders. The SEPI can be in charge of the research and development. And also, the, we should have the global the clinical trial networks. 
And also, we sh should have much more harmonization of the regulatory system. And then, we should have the massive you know, production facilities, maybe located in the uh, low and middle income countries. In addition to that, the allocation, that will be your job as the head of the global, you know, Gavi Alliance in the future. Uh, and the immunization should be the part of the process of the primary health care. And then, how we can uh, create those uh, the network among the existing stakeholders. Without framework, we cannot design such sort of uh, soft governance structure. The, unfortunately, we are now facing very serious geopolitical conflicts. Therefore, the big ban reform cannot be done under the such circumstances. Always, we should be very practical and should share those uh, framework, and then we can design those more practical, you know, uh, the uh, networks as a common for uh, the future pandemic. In this process, the framework is a decisively important as a common ground for the different stakeholders. However, in addition to that, we also have to think how to finance on each stakeholders to collaborate each other. Safety, Gavi, all has a you know capacity to raise the energy resources independently, but we don't have in the global schemes to finance on each stakeholders to collaborate for the same purposes and create end-to-end -end process for those of the global public health goods. So that sort of the global framework we should have at this moment. This is the comment I would like to say. Thank you very much. Yes, please. No, because you know, the, uh, I think the the last two, three comments on the uh, very good question. This is a panel uh, or, or a, a celebration of Michael's legacy towards the future, not not just celebrating the past, but what happens next. And this is, I think, a really important question. But I think the common theme is that health reforms never occur in a vacuum. They occur, and, and this is, of course, a big part of, of, the, of the framework in itself. They always occur in a political uh, or geopolitical context, and they are usually accompanied by other reform movements. The, these big bang reforms are never isolated events. Um, you know, there was never a good time to have a pandemic but the worst time probably was when the world as a whole was experiencing a wave of populist governments which don't engage in the kind of policy dialogue. We, they have a different rationality. Evidence is questioned. Experts are demonized. Uh, it, it is exactly the opposite of what we talk. And that's the, 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 the populist men, mindset. And for whatever reasons, it's, there's a lot of stuff written on this, the world as a whole was caught in this populist wave. And a lot of reforms were challenged. I mean, in the United States, just remember the repealing of Obamacare, the, 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 uh, the Affordable Care Act, the uh, you know, sentence by the Texas judge that declared unconstitutional the entire uh, Affordable Care Act but the United States was saved by its institutions and was saved by the fact that it had an operating democracy and you know, after the results of the election and the Supreme Court actually overruling the Texas judge, now the Affordable Care Act is, is back, back to life. So uh, that didn't happen in Mexico. Mexico had a young democracy and the, the counter reform was exactly the opposite of the use of this framework. It's a different framework. It's a framework based on, on, you know, on, on other considerations, but evidence is explicitly discarded as the product of elites which are uh, despised and or, or vilified. So it, 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 you know, I am hoping that democracy around the world will continue to flourish <laughs> after the pandemic. Uh, and I am hoping, because in addition to the issues on, on reforming the global health governance, 
What the pandemic did show was that most health systems, including in the United States, but certainly in many, many other countries, failed. They were not up to the challenge. There was a, an issue at the global level, but national health systems failed. And because a case we've been making for decades that operate, uh, uh, you know, good health and good health systems are essential for the economy, if we ever needed a dramatic demonstration, that's what's happened. A public health event that triggers the largest economic crisis in a century should catch the eye of policymakers and, 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 and ministers of finance and all these other people we've always been talking about addressing. So I think uh, uh, Mohammed, who I love because I'm Professor Frank and he is <laughs> the Frank professor, uh, <laughs> although not for long, uh, I think you said it very well. He was talking about this constellation at, uh, in, in, of, of events that happen together. And I think, uh, you know, I am, I am very hopeful based on, the, on history that, you know, this wave of populism and counter reform movements will too pass. And that then, again, yet again, Michael's legacy will continue to inspire future big bag reforms. I, I'm not ready to think mm -hmm. that it's over. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. I think um, both Julio and Kezo have, have brought us back to Michael's he, enormous contribution beyond the conceptual clarity within the framework, but also the political dimensions of health reform and how that training and that thinking is so important. And so I've been told that, that we have one minute, so I'll, I'll just quickly close. Um, I want to first really thank all of the panelists um, for the, the thoughtfulness, for the engagement. Uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of other questions, and so hopefully through coffee breaks and lunches and, and ongoing and, and this, this continuation of, of the discussion that we're having here today. Um, but I also want to just say that in leaving and start in, in joining WHO and leaving Harvard, I always said that I felt trained, and I felt trained by Michael, and I felt trained in how to think. Not necessarily trained in public health or economics, which was there, but this thinking. And I think this has come out through this panel is the frameworks are a tool. They help us give structure. They give an entry point. They're an important tool for common language and a process but we still all need to think. And we need to think about what's coming, what are the new agenda items, and how to, how to continue this work moving forward with this, this structure and clarity. So uh, with that, I want to thank everyone. And I think now my job is Veronica has given me my, she's given me my line. I have to just find it to turn to the next, um, the next panel. So now I'm handing over to Manuel Sanchez Castro, whose panel will focus on teaching and learning aspects of health reform. But first, I'd like a round of applause for the, the panelists. Thank you. So hi, everyone. Um, good morning. Uh, very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Manuel Sanchez Castro, and I will be the moderator of this panel that will be uh, discussing uh, the recent uh, students' learnings and the focus that we have had. Oh, uh, by the way, we all were born after 1993, when <laughs> 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 and, and most of them in the 90s. Uh, uh, but um, yeah. Uh, I was uh, very, very uh, fortunate to, to be learning with Michael together with uh, my fellow students uh, past semester. So um, 
while there is a great uh, emphasis on biostatistics and uh, epidemiology in many of the public health programs, um, health reform is uh, sometimes uh, learned at the superficial level. So we, we really think that this was a very transformative uh, part of our education recently. And now uh, we want to share with you a, a around 10 minute video that we made together all the students uh, of the last uh, two classes of Michael, one led uh, by Martin uh, in Mexico, the Mexico field trip uh, and uh, doing health reform right of last fall. So I hand over to the, to the video. Many times, I think you just want to, to have people with you some perspective or who think alike, but it was great to have in the same classroom as him a lot of very contrasting views and have him engage with these people, invite them to the classroom, hear them, and even people within the classroom, students with different views. Um, I think it's great because that's what we need. We need to start hearing other views and start finding the common ground rather than continue to polarize. Michael actually facilitated um, a kind of vibe that like you can critically ask any questions like against the framework or like whatever you want. So um, during our dis class discussion, actually I also have a lot of questions about like why you define like for example financing, how you define the diff like the difference between governance and organization, like such kind of discussions. And these questions, actually they are open-ended questions and Michael also gives us a lot of space to think about our own answers. There's no like right or wrong answers to these kind of questions. And um, you know, this makes me uh, feel like um, we, we students are get respected as in like individual researchers. It doesn't mean that they are professors, so we cannot challenge them or something. And it's more like we are like equally um, sitting in this classroom, discuss some kind of like high level <laughs> framework, but we can also contribute our own thoughts. Professor Reich and uh, Professor Winnie have had sort of this um, conflicting views about um, how to reform the healthcare systems and what's like the important thing to do first. And these sort of um, conflicts, I think is very interesting and also very thought provoking for me. I guess Michael has the ability to build capacity on you to recognize what is possible to do and what is not possible to do. So what I learned from him is so much. I cannot choose just one thing, but his al analytical power to analyze the political, the ethical, the economical views and to integrate everything in just one piece. I guess this is what I, I will love to, to have for myself. Uh, so the course and the book, I think the most important thing that it taught me is that health reform is a three-legged chair. Uh, so it rests on three things. One is technical, and uh, second is political, and the third is um, ethical. And so, uh, and I have been only looking at the, the technical bit. Um, and so I, I've been largely missing the political and the ethical bit. Uh, and so after that, that course, um, I started re you know, reflecting on what are the technical fixes or reforms that you know, it's just not gonna work politically uh, or ethically. Uh, and so sometimes we have to resort to, you know, the second best or the third best um, options, uh, depending on what can work politically and in, in the context of that country's background. So, yeah, I think that's, that was transformative for me. You know, you can't only sit, sit, stand on one leg, right? You can't stand only on the technical leg. So that's, that's very helpful. I think his teaching or 
the JHP 200 class itself made me think more um, policy-oriented questions or health systems level horizontal approach rather than vertical approach of infectious diseases. So I started to have um, have some issues of, okay, what can I contribute in this infectious disease research, um, which might not be the ideal approach when it comes to policy in the long term, when um, health system should be more, um, how can I say, when there is more horizontal approach that is needed. So yeah, he definitely affected me to think more seriously about them. And I guess I'm pivoting more towards those health system focused research. Whatever I was seeing from the clinical perspective of people's access to health was very complementary to what Michael was teaching about uh, Seguro Popular and the case of disappearance and all that we discussed during the case study. So it's, it was kind of a complement to what I had experienced before uh, during my clinical practice and how to approach, approach it from a more health systems perspective and applying the framework to this and just like applying it to the whole population instead of my like specific focus on dietetics. So for the GHP 200, I think it's amazing because it's not only talking about the theory and how you do health reform. It's, um, I mean, like how, what is health reform and the theory behind that, but it's also like the practical things. There are lots of um, guest lectures in which they're like health minister, former health minister from across the globe. And it's really um, thought provoking also for me as I also worked previously in the primary care also has as health policy analyst like I can't relate how it's hard really hard to do the health reform I think like Michael promised a lot of the like a lot of us in his class like this like ever commitment to like doing something better um, and that like brings me to like remembering like why the class also appealed to me by name it was um, this focus on like we can't do it right, we can't do it perfectly, but we can do something better. And I think it's that like ever commitment to like hope that like I feel like underlies like public health and that um, Michael like also um, emphasized throughout his entire course that like we like innovate systems, we work on things, we work with people because we have like hope that something can be better. Um, but that hope is not like a naive thought, but like rooted within like practical learning um, and like focusing on like what are the changes in front of you that you can achieve despite like how intricate or complicated the problem can be. I realized that he doesn't realize that he is teaching me something, even though it's just a conversation. And uh, that's like always amazing for me. Every time I, I walk out of the room where we had this conversation, it's like, oh my God, like I learned even like things related to life, things related to other topics that weren't related to, to the, the thing that we were talking about because he shares like this wisdom and um, I think that he's like one of the most generous people that I've ever met. A professor is someone that more than teaching you technical stuff, is able to connect with you at the personal level and is able to teach you a way of asking yourself questions that are not related with the class or the technical part. And I think that is the most impressive characteristic of him. He's able to transmit a mindset of openness, curiosity, and sincerity that I value enormously and, and that I think it's a absolutely great reminder of, of the values that I, that I pursue. So now we have uh, a little bit of time to follow up uh, some of the questions that we were asking ourselves in the video. Um, and well, let's start with Anna. Uh, in which way, Anna, the, the courses, uh, both doing health reform better or the uh, Mexican field course, uh, transform your, your perspective as a, 
uh, professional in public health? Yeah, for me, um, enrolling into doing health reform better was transformative in a way that it provided me uh, with a completely new for me, a systems way of thinking and understanding public health. So when I first enrolled into my master's program, I never considered myself to be a health systems person or a health system student. And I was more in the social and behavioral sciences department. So I was very interested in learning about social determinants of health, ways to implement programs, and I never even considered the health systems. So when I enrolled into Michael's class, I started learning and understanding um, how important it is to comprehensively understand the systems that we live in as a society and how all of the components come together for us to be able to get this health outcomes that we're very interested on. So I think that was the most transformative part for me to be able to have this idea of a health system, but also a framework that would put all of this together and organize in my mind and be able to understand what are the health outcomes that I'm looking for or what are the other performance outcomes that I'm looking for and from there create the possible interventions, the possible programs, the possible policies or reforms that we could start thinking about um, to improve just even a small, small part of the system. Um, so as a programs person, I was always very passionate about the theory of change and how evidence-based interventions could lead these outcomes or, or could lead to these social and behavioral changes that we were aiming for. But now with a more systems perspective and with Michael's class in the framework and of course the book, I understand that this is only as important as the political context and the societal context and the, how feasible it is to implement actually this intervention in a population. So my perspective has changed in a way that I don't think everyone should like neglect health systems in the field of public health and every student should make a pro priority of understanding health systems and also understanding this framework so that we can have like a common language and common understanding and also a more organized way of collaborating inside the field. Thank you, thank you, Anna. Uh, now uh, over to Asti, who was uh, as well in the in the in both of the courses, and and it was very interesting perspective that you have shared with us. Yeah, so I did take the GHB two hundred um, doing health reform better, but I want to talk about Mexican health system that I was on a trip um, with Michael and so Martin that has been explained before. It's really amazing and transform transformative because we are not only know the theory, but also we did go to the primary care, the hospitals, the community empowerment, and also get to know in Nayarit, so it's like in the rural areas, but also um, in Mexico City, we get to know like many um, great stakeholders and policymakers, and we met also Julio Frank with n knowing that um, it's, it's a complex things, but Michael and also Marianne did ex excellent job in really bridging the theory and also to contextualize what is going on regarding the political um, situation and also how hard it is to have like you know many stakeholders in in between um, this health system and the most and the most ama amazing thing is because we we were the advisor to the mass bienestar um, health policy implementation like how we can analyze make um, this policy like implementative or not and it's uh, it's a really amazing and I think um, it's really important to have like this next generation of glo the next global health leaders to get the awareness and call to action because probably I'm going back to Indonesia and then everyone else like going back to their home country like really doing something because it's kind of like addicting, right? Like when we actually don't know about health system, like what is health system? But when, you know, Michael bring this brainwash things and everything, it's just <laughs> like, it's just like when we get to know what is health system and there's like really unsolved puzzles and really many um, unfinished things that after this. So I think it's really amazing to pass on the beta and like it's us that going push through the reality after we graduate probably. <laughs> and yeah, I think it's amazing. It's been really an honor for me to learn a lot from Michael in these two amazing courses. Thank you, thank you. So yeah, this mix of uh, the field and the theory and how they are intertwined constantly. And it's, it's, really, it's really something that 
uh, uh, it's the, the, the vast majority of the students' experience. So what about you, Leo? What can you tell us about this experience of, of, of learning from Michael's or that framework's perspective? Uh, so for me, first of all, I, I like to say I feel really privileged and, uh, and proud uh, to have Michael as my instructor in class and also a mentor out of class. Uh, and so for in class, um, the, the, the doing uh, health reform better class um, taught me, um, as Anna said, a really comprehensive and analytical way of um, thinking about health systems. Because just like Anna, um, I came to the school, I just graduated undergrad and I majored in math and philosophy, which is not so much related to health systems. So, and that framework and that class really um, got, the con got the dots connected for me for health systems. Um, and arguably more importantly and more transformatively is, as I mentioned in the, in the video and also mentioned by several of our distinguished uh, speakers today, today um, is that um, health reform and health system is a three-legged chair. Um, and it rests on the technical leg, the political leg, um, and the ethical leg. Um, and if you know, if you just sit on one leg, you would you, you would uh, fall, right? And and it's so true because um, at the end of the day, the health system is deeply embedded t into the to the political, the economic, and the social conditions of of the country, and are heavily constrained um, by the context of the country. And that's why um, in in health health system and health reform, we um, sometimes focus on continuous improvement rather than getting there in the first uh, first step. And that's probably why Michael named the course doing health reform better instead of doing health reform best uh, or doing health reform right. Uh, and um, also I'm quoting Michael, he um, said in class that I still remember very vividly, he said um, in health reform, perfect is the enemy of the good. And it's so true. And after finishing his class and after reading and studying um, more health, health system reforms around the world, that, that idea is really fleshed out and, and reinforced over and over for me. And I, I feel really privileged to have learned that concept um, this early in my career. And so I, I thank Michael for that. Thank you, Leo. Thank you. It's uh, pretty pretty interesting um, the perspective of the uh, three leg concept, which I think uh, transgenerationally uh, keeps coming and over and over again. So over to you, Kata. Um, so as I mentioned in the video, I think one of the key learnings from Michael's class and interactions outside the classroom relates to well first how complex health reform is but also how important it is to one understand the culture or the context in which you're doing health reform and to listen to the different stakeholder of or actors that will be affected by this health reform so i've been able to apply this as uh, i'm from colombia and we are currently doing or proposing a health reform and as I analyze this, which is similar to what has happened um, in the last couple of years in different countries in Latin America, I've noticed that many times um, we try to impose a reform rather than actually um, creating spaces to listen to what different stakeholders have to say about their needs and what the reform should look like. Um, and as mentioned in the video, uh, Michael was able to show us that even if we have different views, um, he invited different guests with, with different uh, views, uh, and they engaged in very constructive conversations. And I think this is the, the, the greatest lesson that, that I found, uh, how it is possible to engage in conversation with these people, find the common ground, and then understand from there what the actual reform should be based on. Um, so as I delve into this field, um, I hope to be able to get this, this lesson in practice with every conversation that I have and as I start engaging in health system uh, reform. Um, and I also hope that this lesson can be transmitted to who are currently in power and who will be in power and will create the next reforms because I think that 
although we cannot do health reform perfect if we want to do health reform better, um, engaging in these conversations and actually listening to other people rather than polarizing um, the stage will be key um, for the next couple of years. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kata. Um, so as we have heard from uh, different students, um, the learning of health systems and doing health reform, it's critical and, and should be stressed in the programs. And, and we as students believe that this has been a central part of our training. Secondly, um, we believe as well that providing a common language via a framework that allows us to com communicate from the same words to tackle the problem we're trying to solve, it's essential in order to have a, an effective way of doing our, our job as, as public health professionals. Third, um, we, has been, we have been hearing as well how the field and the theory putting toge put, put together has been absolutely um, one of the most interesting parts of our education and we, we value that as a, as a central part of our, of our training in the school currently. And, uh, and finally, uh, we, we've heard as well some of the ideas in terms of how clinical approach should not be limited in that perspective uh, as the only uh, point of reference when doing our jobs as, uh, as a healthcare professional, but we should be able to think in a broader sense, particularly the, from uh, persons that are coming from the clinical perspective. And uh, yeah, so uh, we were actually, this is uh, um, not normal, but we have a little bit of extra time actually. So we, what we can do maybe is if we can have some questions um, from the public, um, uh, we have like four minutes left. Um, no, they say no, okay, so, uh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so we will finish now then, um, and uh, thank you so much for the, 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 for the time, and we believe we have a group photo now, and uh, so we'll see you in the group photo uh, in a moment. Thank you so much.
We're going to be starting the program in just a moment. If you could please return to your seats. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. We are starting the post-lunch session. Those of you who are still outside, if you would please come back in. I need a bell. We'll give everybody another minute to just come back and settle down. Okay, welcome back. The next session is going to be about the political economy of policy processes. It is moderated by Jesse Bump, who I presume most of you know, but if not, he's the executive director of the Takami Program in International Health, and he's a lecturer in global health policy at the Department of Global Health and Population at the Harvest T. H. Chan School of Public Health. I will let Jesse uh, introduce the panelists and hand over to you. I think a couple of them are joining remotely, so we'll make the technology work for them. So welcome, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant, and, and welcome, everybody. Oh, now I lose my microphone, too. Okay. Uh, I like doubling up, though. So, you know, Michael's not here, and this is a good opportunity to tell a joke uh, that, that, he, that he used to tell a lot, uh, which was that uh, he was at this alumni gathering or something, and uh, so, someone came up to a, one of our then eminent statisticians, a guy named Mosteller, and uh, <laughs> the, the former student said that his teaching, Mosteller's teaching, had changed his life, and he repeated some principle, and then he walked away, and Mosteller shakes his head and says, he got it wrong. <laughs> so, you know, here on this panel where we're talking about political economy, we'll be sure to see Michael rolling his eyes in the front row <laughs> as we take liberties with his ideas and inspiration. So welcome, everyone. I'm delighted to uh, moderate this panel. We have uh, Jeremy Schiffman from Hopkins and Ashley Fox here uh, from Albany. And online, I'm not seeing our online participants yet, but we're going to have Abril Campos from Mexico, and there's Speciosa. Speciosa, welcome. What are we pointing at? I think I just saw them over there. <laughs> there yes, there's Speciosa's back. So Speciosa, Wandira Kazibwe. Uh, from the former vice president of Uganda. So welcome. Welcome to our online panelists. Welcome uh, to Jeremy and Ashley. What we want to talk about today here about political economy is there's sort of three major challenges. We call this the triple burden of political economy. The first of these is that political economy in public health and in global health, it hasn't really figured out its own political economy. So unlike, say, uh, a functioning profession that identifies a business model, gets a flow of resources and grows, the political economy of public health has been growing at a sort of haphazard, almost uh, incremental sort of random process. Our first challenge is how do we figure out how to better institutionalize political economy within health to make it grow and meet some of the enormous demand for these perspectives. The second of these burdens is that 
what I'll call traditional political economy of public health. So the political economy of policy processes, the political economy of health reform, that body of work remains incomplete. So uh, all of us or many of us have studied with or, um, or alongside or worked with Michael to deepen our understanding. But we know that that universe is incomplete and we need to emphasize some of the missing dimensions. For example, the Green Book is a very ministerial, minister-centric view. And we have yet to really unpack what does it mean to do health reform from an activist perspective? How do you engage populations? How do you, how do you take the minister level and go downward? Or how do you go upward? So what's the, how does the minister manage national politics or international politics? There's a wide variety of these things. But the third area is it's a new era of political economy. So if many of you have studied Kingdon or read Michael's work, and it takes place in this fantasy land of the 80s where there's like a functioning government, where there's a House of Congress. Yeah, no, really. Like you have these bureaucrats that monitor things, and when there are changes, draws their attention, and then Congress debates things. You know, that, that model is, is gone. You know, in a new era, we have, many, we have poly crises. We have increasingly nationalistic processes. There's a retreat from multilateralism. And the signs of dysfunction in global governance are everywhere. Climate change, forced migration, multiple crises, Ukraine, Syria. The old style political economy isn't prepared to deal with that. So what we're going to ask each of our panelists are to consider how we can grow in these areas, how we can do more to build the field, how we can do more of the traditional stuff, and what kind of approaches are we going to need to deal with an emerging set of existential problems from climate change to increasing inequality and other challenges. So if Speciosia, if you, if you would permit me, I'll turn to you first. I'll ask each of the panelists to give maybe a three or so minute introduction of themselves and a statement of their interests. And then we'll just take some questions and have a good time until they make us stop at um, 2.30. Okay? And then you'll have a 30 minute break to look forward to. So Speciosia, would you begin, please? Thank you very much, Jesse. My greetings to the panelists there and the participants. I wish I was there with you. Then you would see how passionate I am about political economy after being up in government and parliament and at the local government level for many years. And uh, thanks to Michael, I'm here understanding why things in health are not working the way they should work, despite all the science that uh, has gone into framing the questions and coming up to talk about what should be done. From what I know and the practice, even before I, 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 I was part of my, my course classes when I, I came to Harvard, is that uh, in, in the ministries of health or the health fraternity and researchers in the health arena are not doing what they should do about the health of the population. They are actually looking at those who fall out of the, the basket, the sick people. And in doing that, it's like it's a global club of people who work together forgetting that politicians exist and that they do work, looking at the next election when they need to go back and get a mandate. So they are sort of working in a bubble. As a, a medical person, as a, a surgeon myself, who also practiced for some time, I also noted that uh, in my country, I'll talk about my country because I was also vice chairperson or vice president of the Uganda Medical Association. Associating with the people who did arts was like uh, going down, pulling yourself down as far as social status was, uh, was, is concerned. And even then, I tried very hard to get my colleagues to make sure that we sit with other people. When you go back to the traditional training 
of a, a, a medical doctor with an a, a, a degree in medicine and surgery. We also did public health. We were like, you know, jacks of all trades. And the public health were taught included everything. At that time, the doctor was the sanitary engineer. You had to also calculate the size of the roof of the house, know the amount of rain that is expected in that particular locality, and also calculate the size of tank for water catchment. And you are also responsible for following up on the health of the family at family level. That time, there were not very many experts. We didn't have many engineers. But institutionally, the way government had organized before independence, the health sector, it was under the ministry responsible for community development. And the, 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 at independence, this ministry was split when before issues of agriculture, nutrition, animal health, uh, you know, community development, mobilization of the population was under the leadership of one ministry, one minister of community development. Under that same ministry, there was a department responsible for medical. It was called the medical department. At independence, after independence, that department was taken away to become the Ministry of Health. It should have been named the Ministry of Diseases. So we, we really have to look at the, the, the nomenclature and the titles we also give to these ministries because they, they define them. And where they came from, what happened at that time? And why was it working even at that time? So we produced a ministry, ministries which were born under a, a, a population health dimension, but we now took it away with the, the personnel who are trained to treat people, to treat diseases. So up to now, we are living with that legacy of misappropriating or apportioning a part of a ministry which from the beginning knew that the health of the population was paramount and the department of medicine was to take care of those people who, who actually became sick. And it was not the biggest department even then. So this is where we see where the population is far away from the health architects. The population is actually closer to the politicians. And then because we've come up with this issue of sciences, that the biological and physical sciences are the sciences, the social sciences have been put in another basket to watch these people who are supposed to be the, the brightest in their classes determine what they want to do. But at the same time, these people are on a high pedestal and they don't think politics matters because their jobs are assured, the, the, their pay was assured. So you ended up with the people in courts, subjugating also other people at lower cadres who are responsible and now moved to do public health. In the end, we get what we have. What I can see after becoming a social scientist is that we have to do a lot of work of mobilizing the politicians to recognize that if they expect the results that they want, and if resources are to be voted by the economists to go to support the health of the population, they may have to actually maybe split the roles because to now get this Ministry of Health with the doctors, consultants, 
All they talk about is medicine. That is the first thing. Where are the medicines? Where are the x-rays? Even in COVID, this, is, this was the priority. Buying breathing machines and all that. In many countries, social scientists were not brought on board to actually say the key issue here is the behavior of the people, which is even more complex than the, the science, the, the biological or social sciences. I've also seen that in, in Africa, the universities are ivory towers, and a lot of the work they do does not feed into the local policy cycle. They work mainly with external donors, and when they've given them the money, they report there, and you hardly see you actually. I have not, I've been sitting in my Ministry of Health since 2011, a very good number of years now, and I have not seen a researcher locally calling policymakers in the Ministry of Health to be part of the reviewing of their research. They work in isolation. The universities are not engaged as departments with all these uh, the professors so that they engage the, the key issues. They do the research, send whatever they want. They write uh, papers and they get promoted as professors and that consultants. But in the end, the country many times sees it does not benefit a lot. So just uh, in, in brief, I like definitions. In our culture, what is in a name? When you give somebody a name, they usually end up looking like that name. But uh, the Minister of Health has failed to look like the name it is given. It should be called Ministry of Diseases. <laughs> the public health we talk about chases diseases. They look at issues of immunization, ringing in vaccines and medical technology, forgetting that health is actually made in the home and in the communities. So to me, a lot of mobilization needs to be done. It's not only about communication, because when we say communication, the very same policymakers in the ministries of health who are doctors will go and do a two weeks course in communication and call themselves communicators, instead of working with people who have degrees in communication. When you talk about IT, the very doctors, they will now want to go and do a two weeks course, a two weeks course on IT, so that they now go into the, they preside over people who are experts in their fields. When it comes to laboratory technology, Again, these people are experts in their area, but they will also get somebody with an MBCHB or an MB to preside over what is happening. So the work is quite a lot. And I think researchers also have to, to, to rethink how they frame the questions they are putting forward to address the people who are incumbent because change is many times slow when it is at the technical and professional level. By the time you weed out the generation of people who are trained to think in one particular way, and then you bring in a new breed of people with a different thinking, it takes decades. So the work has to start, and I'm glad Michael Reich has been at it for a long time, but does not have proponents if he could get more of the medical doctors do political economy as the doctorates like I was persuaded to do by my boss, the president then, it is not easy. And I'm finding it also very, very difficult to really convince people that this is the way to go. Population health, work with the other experts, do research with the people in different fields as a team, if we really want to help the people who, 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 who send, send us to do what we should do. I think uh, those comments should be enough <laughs> to start with. Thank you, Speciosa.
Yeah, so let me turn to Jeremy and Ashley and reiterate the three minute expectation, please. <laughs> Thank you. It was, was I to speak for three minutes only? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> please go ahead, Jeremy. You've got uh, Abril, do you wanna? Uh, no, we'll go back to Abril. She, Abril is our, our fourth panelist. Oh, okay. So, we'll, yeah, sorry. We'll go uh, Jeremy and then Ashley and then over to Abril. Okay, so uh, actually, I, I, you, you raised some good questions, Jesse, about advancing the field of political economy of health policy analysis. Um, and I'm, I'm like M Michael, I was trained as a political scientist and then I entered the health policy analysis field, and he's offered me great advice over the years. Um, I, I think, I, can I just ask a quick question? Because I'd like to direct my comments, especially to those of you who are presently doctoral students, about what I think in response to Jesse's question. Who, who, who here is a doctoral student? So we've got a bunch in the audience. So I, I, I would make two quick points. The first is that the agenda that Michael started and is most responsible for pushing the world to do, which is to recognize that health policy making is inherently political. It's inherent to the process. You can't weed it out. And if, if it, um, that agenda persists and it's still a problem that we ignore that. So despite several decades of scholarship, Despite all kinds of changes within schools of public health, political science, and I think Michael believes this too, remains at the margins in these schools. And that's deeply unfortunate. And so in a way, we still have to get on with the basic task of convincing our colleagues that politics cannot be weeded out, that they're central to the process, and we need to continue to study it. So that's just a basic point. I'll make one further point. Um, and this is a bit in tension with some of the comments that were made this morning about the value of frameworks. I think we have a problem with frameworks in the health policy political economy field. We jump too quickly to them. And they have their place, their role. Abriel and Michael's recent framework on policy implementation is excellent. Um, policy Triangle by Lucy Gilson and Jill Waltz. I've developed frameworks. They have their place, but they also stifle thought. And if I had one big piece of advice to doctoral students is don't start with those. It's the opposite to some of the advice that was given this morning. Go back to the social science upon which these frameworks were founded read the sociology, the political science, the anthropology, the history, the psychology. Go into moral foundations theory. Look at Bourdieu in sociology and theories of structure and agency. Go beyond the policy process models. Kingdom is great, but look at cutting edge research in constructivist international relations theory. Look at new uh, developments in the study of history. I, th I think that the way we advance the field of political economy of health is to go beyond the models that we've been relying upon and engage the social science uh, directly in the way that Michael has always done. I mean, look at his models. They're grounded in basic political science theory. Doctoral students should do the same. Thank you. Ashley? Wonder, wonderful comments so far, and um, thank you for inviting me to join into, the, into this panel and to celebrate the work of Michael Reich. So I think what I will focus my brief three minutes, and I'll try to be three minutes around, is really just talk about some opportunities right now as well as some risks in terms of the political economy of health policy. So I think in terms of opportunities, um, there is a real opportunity right now in that COVID-19 has really shed light on the importance of politics to public health responses. And so I think right now uh, is a moment where political science um, and political informed analysis uh, has a moment to really make a difference 
in public health. Um, no longer can people, sort of public health practitioners, ignore the fact that they need to understand politics, um, as we've seen in order to bring along policymakers. Um, we have to understand the politics of it. We have to understand what motivates them, what uh, gets them engaged in public health, uh, and to care about the policies that we are putting forward. Also to engage the public. We have to understand how the public is going to react to public health policies. And to do that, we have to have a keener understanding of political science and politics. So I think the opportunity is that we actually do have the chance to build out our um, public health schools, potentially, with more uh, people trained in political science. Uh, I think that that is a goal that we should really be pushing for. Uh, but I think the risk is that we haven't actually learned the lessons from COVID, um, and that, in fact, perhaps we've even learned the opposite lesson, that you know, politics is somehow seen as an obstacle to public health. So this was a common refrain that we've heard you know, throughout the, the pandemic, you know, just follow the science, um, politics is getting in the way of public health. Um, I think really what we should have learned is the opposite, that in fact, we can't really do anything without engaging with politics, and also perhaps that we shouldn't really try to advance policy without engaging politics. There's something very anti-democratic about the idea that we should have these sort of you know, insulated bureaucrats and technocrats um, you know, making policy from on high uh, without um, engaging the public and the broader um, constituents that are involved. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to push back on that, but also the risk that, um, we, um, that public health has not learned that lesson. The other quick point that I want to make, sort of related to that, um, is about the, the three-legged chair, which has come up a number of times today. Um, and you know, I really think that we need to recenter the political and the ethical analysis uh, in that three-legged chair, and maybe make the, the, the technical part a little less central, actually. Um, so I, you know, I really think that we first need to agree on where it is that we want to go. Um, and only then can we figure out how to actually get there. Um, and the technical is really a means to an end as opposed to an end in itself. Uh, so we need to first recenter the political and the ethical and understand what are we trying to achieve, what are our goals. And then the technical is really just, well, OK, how do we actually get there? Um, so I think I'll, I'll stop there. Great, wonderful. Now let's, let's turn to Abril again online. Jesse, um, let me start quickly by saying that um, I wish I could be there in person. I'm about to give birth, and a friend reminded me that one can have it all, but not at the same time. But Michael, this was very hard to let go. <laughs> so I really wish I could be there. Um, thank you, Jesse, for challenging us to think about the future. I was ready to just talk about the past and the unfinished agenda. But you really challenged us, and it was a hard task. So I started by thinking about what has changed and what are the implications. So I think that the processes of health policy making are changing in three important ways, uh, especially drawing from my experience in Mexico. I see three major changes. Um, the first one is that policy making processes are less transparent now. The second one is there is less focus on evidence data is questioned or ignored. And the third one is it's harder for multiple stakeholders to participate in the process. And these were key attributes of good health policymaking, right? Transparency, evidence informed, or at least a recognition that evidence and data matters, and inclusivity. So this is not to say that we had a, a reached a golden age of health policymaking, but over the last two decades, again, at least in Mexico, a lot of progress was made um, you know, it was widely recognized the need of, uh, for evidence that institutions, transparency, inclusive processes all mattered for good health policymaking. So the recent policy changes in Mexico are an example of, of the emergence of what we could call a new kind of policymaking. And, and Dr. Frank was... Oh, are we still here? Oh, okay. Um, Dr. Frank mentioned some of these changes earlier today, and, and perhaps we have a less optimistic view of the future because of the context in Mexico. But we have two options. We either wait until the tables turn, 
so that we can use our framework, our nice policy cycle again, or we adapt. And if we choose the second option, then the question is, how do we stay relevant? What do we do as health policy scholars interested in supporting the adoption and implementation of health reforms? Can we rethink our framework and methods? And so my expertise is in using applied political analysis. I have worked with Michael on developing a framework to manage the politics of health policy implementation. And I have three ideas for a way forward in using applied political analysis to improve the chances of successful reform. The first one is, you know, thinking, I think, Jesse, you mentioned uh, at some point, you know, perhaps the unit of analysis is no longer the nation state. Uh, and that led me to think, uh, perhaps then the national policymakers may not need to be at the center for driving health reform. And we can shift our focus to studying and supporting people-led um, health policy changes. Uh, we have focused on teams of policymakers and on supporting them in designing, adopting, and implementing health reforms. And perhaps now we need to look at people, that category of stakeholders that we usually call beneficiaries. Could they be uh, initiating health reform? Anya mentioned earlier today that Michael gathered a few of us to write a manual for practitioners on getting get health reform right. Um, perhaps we need to think about getting health reform for the people and how do we do this? What methods we need to use and, um, and, and, and how do we do this? The second idea is, um, sorry, I think the noise is coming from my computer, so let me just uh, close my... The second idea has to do with a stronger focus on values. And, and here my question is, can we use applied political analysis to shape the values of society? Because we know that to address the challenges of inequality, climate change, you know, what societies value need to change. So th the work of Michael helped demystify the concept of political will and gave us hope uh, by showing us how one can create political feasibility. So perhaps we can demystify the concept of, of values and think about shaping values as an objective of political analysis. In the past, our point of departure has been that a given society has certain values and this will inform the selection of their policy options. But perhaps it's time to think more about how values are amenable to change and, and how do we do this. And finally, the third idea is a stronger focus on communication. And I think Speciosa was also referring to this. We know that applied political analysis is not an end in itself, but rather a means to enabling and managing change and the results need to be used to develop strategies. I think that a stronger focus on developing communication strategies is needed. With the pandemic, we witnessed the rise of infodemic, too much information, including false or misleading information. So communication as a key uh, critical political strategy uh, moving forward. So my final comment is that we need to adapt fast. <laughs> if we want to stay relevant, we need to come up with ways to keep bridging the gap between research and practice in this new and challenging context. Back to you, Jesse. Great, thank you, Abril, and thank you to all, all the panelists. So, you, you know, just to, to uh, polarize their views and create something interesting, you know, Abril is saying that policy making is now opaque, evidence doesn't matter, and processes are non-democratic, <laughs> right? And, you know, she's, she's right about that. Uh, Jeremy says frameworks don't matter. And he's sort of right about that because people aren't thinking hard enough. You know, they should go back to more fundamental factors and re-derive things for themselves. Now, Ashley says, COVID gives a bunch of opportunities to learn and yet nobody learned. And it, yeah, it's true. And that, uh, you know, this is one of the basic problems of, of uh, public health and global health is really normative about all about what should happen and then no attention to what actually doesn't happen. So it's like this question is like, how, how do we go, where do we go from here, right? If, if there's this massive worldwide demonstration of inequality and ineffectiveness of public health, like, okay, what's next? Like, how, how do we go forward? And this is the same comment that Speciosa is making about how the Ministry of Health is really the Ministry of Diseases. And we know there's not that much health in there, right? The Ministry of Health doesn't even oversee the basic sanitation that defines public health. It does work on diseases in hospitals. So the question like, where do we go from here is particularly salient in, in view of the remarks that our panelists have made. But I'd love to take some questions from the audience. Um, let's see, uh, see if we can generate a little conversation here amongst our very controversial panelists. <laughs> <coughs> mm. 
Michael, you're stirring uncomfortably. Do you disagree? <laughs> Thank you. My name is Sandra Lubiano. I'm a PhD student in health policy, second year at Harvard. My question is, uh, I heard this comment related to how do we shape something like the preferences of the society so they care about the things that we think they should care about. And my question is, um, why don't we first learn what society cares about and then how can we shape what we think is like something that they should be caring about but like attaching those things to the things that society really cares about. Like why should we be the ones shaping their preferences instead of first um, understanding their preferences? An excellent question. Heather, let's, let's take another one or two here. Hey, I mean, I guess in theory from Michael, we learned about political skill and how to set agendas and how to move things forward. So can we use these frameworks and skills ourselves to get politics and policy analysis taken seriously at schools of public health, in the CDC, at ministries of health? I mean, can we be our own project? Yeah, so I'm Talia Porteni. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Health Policy at um, Columbia University School of Public Health. I heard some comments uh, related to, you know, um, yes, frameworks matter, but maybe not. Um, we need to adapt. We need to be flexible. The reality is we're not that many, and we're strong with numbers, right? To what degree should we uh, align ourselves with where we are and what, what we're doing and where we're going, and to what degree is it uh, strategic and preferable to actually be more flexible, to be more adaptable? Um, what is really like the bottom line that we want to be perceived as doing in terms of where we're going? Okay, great. Three, three wonderful questions. So uh, may maybe, Specioso, we could turn to you first for this question about uh, do, whether we listen to what society wants and how we would factor that into our future plans. You want to take that one first? Uh, yes, Jesse. The thing is, maybe it's the way we are trained. We are elites, and we are not trained to listen, even when we are in the, in the area of... Uh, of uh, the, the health, those who do research in health. But the key thing is, if you make political science at the center of that three-legged school uh, stool, there is no way you want to listen. Which means that uh, unless we actually understand that the population has changed. The levels of education are far higher than the, the, when people first talked about those frameworks. Because it was like I'm the professor in a university and I know best. Also because of the language that is used when training is being done. It is very important to really get to understand what the communities want. And uh, to me, community participation is really key. Because when you work in the villages and you explain the role of politics in the villages, it's politics which influences what the people get. Otherwise, they are their own private sector. They are not looking for jobs. They know that if there is a road, I should be able to reach a hospital when I need it. But the same road will also bring me inputs into what I'm doing. So the other thing is we are failing to also use technology and apply it in a way that would really make politics feasible for purposes of improving 
the public health and the policies that actually need to be put in place. So it is very important for communities to be engaged and to participate. And that is possible now because across the world, people are more aware. And then you have to make political science sexy. How do you make it interesting? How do you get even the politicians themselves who are in our parliaments and everything? Because being a political scientist does not mean you are going to influence the policy or what is going on in the country. But how, as a political scientist, how you, do you get into that arena of the public to be able to guide the political processes that are the key to ensuring that the, the health of the population is okay. This we see is really lacking. Like I said, the universities, they have their own clubs. And then the, the pol political science, even at the university, is not mainstreamed across other sectors. We are now saying, people saying, when you do medicine, you must do some management. When you do medicine, you must do some economics. When, but nobody is saying that even in the medical school, there should be a course on politics and political economy. They should really make sure that these people have it in every medical school, every school of public health. So the population is at the community level, and the politics is the people who vote for those who go, make sure policy is put in place. And I really agree that uh, really the technical people are just tools for what the people need to be put in place. I agree thoroughly that we must engage the people now. They are better educated. The communication is even much easier. Universities are more open and we, with the the new technology like what we have, people are having their minds even more open to listen and understand that politics is very important. And from Africa, people are recognizing that. What can be done to the health of people in Sudan, in Somalia? All this is the, the, the political play, players are crafting the playing field for anything to happen. So health, should also come in and this is the training in the in the in the universities and the few of you should now be the advocates because you understand best and you have the ways of doing research and engaging other researchers to be able to do research into what really makes politicians tick and how do we get them to listen to what the people want Wonderful. So I actually have an answer for one of your questions. You make political science sexy by going to a history department. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, that, I'm not sure that answer scales that well, but you know, it's okay. Um, Jeremy, maybe you'd like to take up this question that Heather was asking about how do we make a project of ourselves? Like how do we set an agenda where we actually come first? You know, I, I, I was just thinking about Heather's question and, and thinking about the recent framework model that Abriel and Michael developed on the stakeholders in policy implementation and how that might, uh, I mean, there, there's, there are six group, constituency groups, right? The, lead, the leaders, the beneficiaries, financial, um, mm -hmm. I, I don't remember all six, but um, <laughs> sorry, Michael. <laughs> I, te I teach the, I, I, ma I make my students read the article, they remember all six, so don't worry if I don't. Um, anyway, the, the <laughs> um, it, it's a very nice mapping of the different stakeholders that you would need to uh, uh, engage and influence in order to move the policy process. You might translate that into um, these kinds of different kinds of stakeholders and how they shape, say, a school of public health um, and map their interests. So you got the students, you got the dean, you got the, per the, the president who shapes the dean, you got the financial politics, you got other bureaucracies within the university, the different schools competing for scarce resources. 
Um, you have various interest groups outside. Now I'm getting all six right. You've got various <laughs> in interest groups uh, uh, outside the the school itself, uh, and and you know use a systematic mapping of their interests and their concerns and leverage all their power um, to alter the structures within, say, a school of public health to say have political science as being something important. <laughs> um, so maybe there are ways to to do that. Um, can I, if you don't mind, can I make a quick comment on the last question? Because I think that you're raising a very good question about um, unity versus flexibility in expanding our field. Do we gravitate more toward a, a set of frameworks, models that anchor the field and try to bring a cohesiveness to it versus just let it unfold and flow and let's see where it goes? And you, I, I think the way you posed it was without a normative stance on it, just to raise the question. And I think it's a very good question. Uh, personally, I gravitate toward the latter position. I think our field of political, if you want to call it political economy, there are multiple terms out there. Political economy analysis for health, there's health policy analysis, politics of health, whatever you want to call it. I, I, I think we're coming to a, a, a point in time where the field is going to become more robust by being flexible and doing away with boundaries and stop trying to pretend that there should be demarcated boundaries, but instead embrace multiple social scientific ideas to uh, unsettle the field. That's what I want to see. So you, you want it to be unsettled? I, 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 I want the field to become unsettled with concepts not traditionally used in the health policy analysis field. And to be mm. honest, it's, it's too much anchored in theories of the policy process based on analyses of the United States political system. When it sort of worked in the 80s. <laughs> well, it's not that those models are, I, I think Kingdon's a very powerful model. Um, I think street-level bureaucrats and Lipsky is a valuable set of ideas, but th there's too much of that. <coughs> Bourdieu, more for your question about we under we need to understand what people think. Moral psychology. Jon uh, uh, Jonathan Haidt of, of of New York University and that whole tradition of understanding the deeper. Um, belief systems of individuals that animate, that are conservative versus liberal, that animate what we value and that underpin differences in society. Let's bring moral psychology into health policy analysis. That's an example to get at what you're getting at. They're not traditionally used by us. They should be. So Ashley, Ashley teaches in a school of public administration. So in expectation, your students are going to become administrators, maybe politicians, but people who are concerned with some aspect of the public sector. How do they engage with these areas? Or how do you, what, what kind of teaching do they want? What lessons do they take away? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's been really interesting, uh, this sort of transition from being mainly in a public health environment to being in an environment when we're actually public health is sort of secondary and the public administration and the policy is really at the forefront um, and teaching students that actually have a very good grasp of the policy process and public administration theories and all of that. And actually it's really teaching them that, ha now I'm gonna go back on what I said before, that having some technical knowledge of public health actually does matter to make better policies um, and that, that, that piece is helpful. Um, but I, I think, I, I do want to see us better integrate these fields. I mean, I really think that these silos are one of the biggest challenges. And we were, you know, chatting back in the green room about the fact that, you know, this, the typical arrangement is you have a school of public affairs in one place, often on an entirely different campus, you have a school of public health. And that's the case at my university, the case in many universities. And I, I do think that that stifles discussion and exchange um, even the fact that our, uh, the way that we search for articles, right? You know, if you are a health scholar, you search in PubMed. If you are a uh, public affairs person, you're gonna search in JSTOR, right? Um, fortunately, with Google Scholar, you can pull up all of that uh, all at once, so maybe that's helping to rectify the situation. But I, I do think we need 
to break down these silos um, and break down these barriers um, if we want to really do what I'm suggesting, which is really integrate these fields more. Can I really briefly pick up on, um, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to pick up on sort of this question about understanding preferences and maybe this kind of gets at some of the different questions, but I, I think another point that I wanna make is that we really need to broaden our definition of evidence you know, so we've talked a lot about evidence-based policy. This is a sort of you know, buzzword that comes up all the time. But I've often puzzled at you know, what do we actually mean by evidence? I, I guess maybe coming from more of a political science background, I, it, it, I'm not exactly even sure what that means, right? Is that evidence that we can derive from randomized controlled trials? Is that evidence of effectiveness of a policy? Maybe a little sprinkling of you know, cost effectiveness or efficiency. I think we really need to bring in all the different types of evidence to bear um, when we're trying to design and craft a policy, right? Including things like evidence on public preferences, right? So public opinion um, information, that a lot, a lot of my research is on public opinion. What does the public actually think about this? How might they respond to this particular policy? Ethical analysis, right? Um, actually take seriously the fact that there are ethicists that engage in you know, their own process for coming up with what is the most ethical solution in this given scenario. Uh, and put together all these different pieces of evidence from different fields to make a well-rounded decision in the way that policymakers actually do, right? They, they do look at all the sources of evidence, not just a narrow definition of is this effective or not, but what are going to be the broader impacts on society? What are these different stakeholder groups? How are they gonna to respond to this? You know, how is this gonna affect the economy and not just how is it going to impact this narrow particular disease? Um, so I think that is also our task is to build more well-rounded students that have the ability to bring together those different sources of evidence. Great, and Abril, I, I wanted to ask you a related question. We've been talking a lot about politics and on the economy side of political economy, since you're a research professor, I wanted to ask you, what are the sources of money? So where you can raise money for research, which, <laughs> wh who are the funders and what do they want to pay for? Mm. Let me start by saying that I'm a very new research professor. Until very recently, I was a practitioner, Jesse. So I'm also finding out um, about that uh, as well. I mean, at least in the institute where I am, so I'm in the School of Government, but also affiliated to an Institute for Obesity Research. And actually that's one of my um, top questions, right? And, and, and I'm, I'm addressing it more from the perspective of a, 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 an ethical code, right? Like wh where, where, is the, you know, where is the financing coming from? Where, where can we get um, funds to do the research that we wanna do in a way that, um, doesn't uh, bring, uh, you know, harmful actions or inappropriate actions due to conflict of interest. So um, that's not exactly uh, related to what you were saying, but that's really on top of my head right now. Um, so I think it's been hard to find um, research funds to do political analysis, I, I, I should say. Um, I think, I mean, Michael is able to do this and I still have to learn how he manages to do that. But I, I do see a big gap in, in, in funding for applied political analysis, especially because we are really, or at least my interest is in supporting practice and supporting practitioners. And so it's, it's kind of this research that is, it's quite action oriented and, and, and who funds that, right? It's, it's either the person interested in the research, so like the, you know, the agencies of the government, et cetera, but I, I, I have found a, a big gap in, in, in identifying funding for this kind of um, research, I should say. And if I may just add two points, uh, Jesse, on the question about the values and preferences, uh, which I think was a, a really great one. Sure, go ahead. Um, just, so for me, there's no question that, of course, we need to, we need to listen to people. Um, I think what I was thinking is when, you know, for example, thinking about climate change, right? Like we need to, we know that we need to think about long-term benefits and costs, right? Like we need to care about the health of the future generations. And that's that's a value of society. And, 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 and so when thinking about that, I said, well, is there a space for us to then also shape and generate the evidence, generate the communication strategies, et cetera, and support the people 
um, to, 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 to care about those issues and, and to shape those values, I mean. But I know it's controversial because we've always stayed kind of very, um, you know, again, our departure point was the society has its values and then we, you know, we come later. We say, okay, these are your policy options based on your... So I think, I, I mean, I'd love to keep discussing this, this idea of should we, can we shape the values of a society to address the, the challenges? Uh, and just a second point, I think, you know, I mentioned three, in a way, negative changes of policymaking, but I think a victory has been that um, now we don't need to convince anyone that health policymaking is inherently political, I, in my opinion, at least, or in Mexico it would be, it's it's not hard for people to see that it's political. So I think that's that's a victory, and I agree with you, um, uh, Jeremy, that I think now giving much more flexibility to the to the field and and more space to come up with new ideas. Now that I think we've we've won some battles, I think would be very useful in advancing the field. Yeah, great, thank you. So look, we'll have chance for another round of questions. Uh, I, you know, while you're while you're formulating that. Yeah, Di, we'll come to you in a second. I, I want to editorialize in a dangerous way for, for just a moment. You know, the, this morning we had very nice remarks from Dean Feinberg. And on the historical part, he got it wrong. So, you know, at the beginning, at the dawn of public health, as it professionalized, he said that political science wasn't there. In fact, political science was there. One of the most eminent political scientists, the guy who invented progressive taxation, he was there. And he got out-competed. It's like political science, political economy, they've always been part of public health. But they lost out to the biomedical life sciences people who were able to organize and fund themselves and build NIH. You know, we used to do lots of these things. So you're also in a historical struggle, one where many people have said public health means communities. It means you have to go live with them and think about what they want and listen to them and build some trust, create outreach, like public health nursing. It was part of that. But this early foment of ideas, it lost out in a political economy sense. It just lost out. They couldn't raise money the way the life sciences people could. They didn't convince the Rockefeller Foundation, which the other people did. Mm -hmm. We didn't mm -hmm. have the right advocates. It's like the political people didn't have the political strategy. The other ones just went out and made money. And then they built institutions around themselves. So that's still what you can raise money for. Like, you know, you want to study TB, go right ahead. You know, TB, for example, we learned how to control TB to eliminate it in developed countries a long time ago, right? You know, those no, no spitting on sidewalk signs it comes from that. And, uh, you know, there were 10,000 papers published last year indexed in PubMed on tuberculosis. Right? This game that we're playing, it's not really about health. It's about something else. So my challenge to the audience and to the panelists is to think about, like, how do you change that game? How do you realign it? So it isn't about self-satisfying scientific research, which is totally self-satisfying. I love that stuff. It's just not about health, and I care about health too. So let's take some questions. Uh, Di, I see you had your hand up, then we'll go to Prashant. Yeah, and then, then in the back there. We'll take another round and we'll return to our panelists. Thanks, uh, my name is Di, I'm from ThinkWell. Um, it's kind of, maybe you think it's a little bit stupid, Question, but I used to design furniture a long time ago, and then when you have a three legs chair, that's extremely stable for wobbling, but then not stable for toppling, like a flipping. But then if you can have the four legs chair, it's usually more stable to really make the bigger change. So my question is, if you're going to add one more leg to this framework, what would that be? Because for me, for example, like uh, with all those Apple watches ca constantly capturing this health data and then the people asking the question to the chat GPT about my health conditions and others, something like a technology or data ownership may be the one that the change the health sector reform in the next generation. So it may be that, that three legs may be as Jeremy said at the beginning, maybe updated. So I would love to hear that what would be the one more leg that you want to add? Thanks. <laughs> yeah, please. Thanks, Jesse. Very stimulating conversation. I think a fundamental uh, trade-off in strategy, which is adapt versus shape, 
is what I heard a lot of people talking about. Do we take public health interventions and adapt, adapt them to fit the political process and the policy making process? Or do we shape to take the first best public health intervention and shape the policy making and political process to fit the first best versus the adapt? Right, so in the adapt versus shape strategy, those who choose the adapt are more likely to get research grants approved. Journal editors will be happier. Referee two will give them a somewhat better <laughs> review. Whereas those who take the shape approach are discounted on all of these metrics of intellectual output. And as a result, as a community, including people who are journal editors, referee twos, and et cetera, we are doing this service to those who want to shape. And Speciosa was bringing out this, and, and Abril was talking about the values to society. I think somewhere the collective community has to ask this question between adapt and shape. If we think shape is what society needs for public health, um, then let's not shy away from it. And there are enough people in this room to, to make that change systematically on PNT committees, in journal editorial processes, in refereeing, starting new journals when needed, et cetera. Yeah, thank you. Great ideas. Yeah, uh, in, in the back there, and then we'll come to you, Celine. Hi, I'm Diana Weil, um, a student of Michael's you know, 35 years ago, and a long time in WHO doing policy and strategy. And I wanted to say that each of the speakers in this panel, it's been exciting to hear your voice about um, the changing environment we're in. I, I want to recall what uh, Julio said earlier about populism and the rise of communications and voices and celebrity voices, because I feel like what's changed most for me in the time that I've been in public health, I think I read Michael's book on toxic politics and did the case study method at Harvard and Jeremy's papers on the dynamics across institutions and individuals really taught me when I was doing policy and strategy, it's really that dynamics between institutions and individuals, but now fueled by very sophisticated communication strategies funded by donors with positions or politics with positions. And now we have Twitter, which dominates what people read, even in the even in the research field. I mean, who's the best communicator? We also have celebrities in public health. I mean, over our 30 years, we know who those talking heads are that are always the people that people go to to hear speak. Are we doing sufficiently to get to those influencers? Speciosa, I think, brought up very appropriately that we now have incredible advocates in the community, many of whom who are on Twitter or TikTok, and are we using those voices and, and helping facilitate those voices that aren't so funded or um, co-opted, but are truly voicing diversity? So I think if we can think about the Twitter world we're in, I'm wondering what the speakers think about, are we using it sufficiently as people coming from a policy background and, and uh, analytic background? Thank you, and, and Celine over here. My name is Celine Manga. I am coming from Peru, and I am a current Takemi Fellow at Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, thank you, Professor Bam, for an amazing discussion, and to the panelists. Um, so what I saw in my country is that exists and uh, a very complete framework of laws, of policies, because the policy makers are very well educated in Peru. So our policy framework is almost complete, and I believe it looks very sexy, Espaciosa. But mm -hmm. the gap between the implementers and the policy makers is, is growing up. And so this gap uh, now, after the COVID pandemic, has suffered a lack of resources. Staff, uh, many resources. and. So at the implementation side, we face many constraints. Uh, if, you, if we compare, for example, in the public health field, the number of educated and sophisticated educated mm -hmm. people at the side of policy making is very nice. But we cannot translate those beautiful evidence-based 
policies into actions because at the implementation side, we have so much failure, so much lacks. Thank you. Great, so we've got a round of questions here. Let's uh, turn to our panelists. So J Jeremy, as the senior academic among us, I, I'd like to tell us what that fourth leg is. <laughs> that, uh, that's the question I hope I wasn't I was hoping I wouldn't get because I, <laughs> um, I, I, I don't have a clear idea I mean I, the one that popped in my mind but it's already there I mean economics is central to the discipline I mean political scientists have been fighting hard to get the notice that economists do in the field um, and, but, but I mean, that overlaps with the technical, of course, right? So I, I, I don't have a clear answer. Could I answer, ask a, answer a different question? <laughs> okay, so like. <laughs> like one of our, the others. <laughs> our for, uh, okay, our fourth, our fourth leg is evasion. Okay, okay, I got you, <laughs> yep. Okay, yeah, sure. Do you want me to choose for you or are no, you gonna no, evade I, again? No, I wanted to choose. Okay, <laughs> tell me, tell me. What's it gonna be? Uh, uh, um, the, the question that came from over here about adapting versus shaping. Well, I, you just, you already answered that. If you were going to avoid that you're, you're no, not no, adapt, you know, adapt or shape, that was a shaping question. So you're adapting. Yeah, so, okay. see, right. I, I know how to maneuver. You give your no, own answer. No, no but I, 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 were you asking that in the context of how we move school, the schools we work in to appreciate our work? Was that the context? <laughs> I mean, the person who knows the most about that is sitting in the front row. Um, I, I just, I, I don't have a macro level perspective on that. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a professor with a joint appointment in the School of Public Health at Hopkins and the School of Advanced International Studies. I, periodically, they try to get me to be a, like associate dean or something, and I always say no. <laughs> um, so if I had that perspective, I might have more insight. But what I did just want to say is I try in my daily work every day to not adapt but shape, right? And, like, and that means things like pu push for new courses um, when an anthropologist comes up for promotion and she has written a book. Tell the epidemiologist that her book is really good and don't count the number of articles she wrote. That's not a valid measure for her getting tenure. Uh, she's done deep ethnographic research. She can't just sit at a computer and produce lots of articles with data. Um, I think that's my attempt from my narrow perch to shape. And I honestly, I feel like it works. Like, if, if, I, if, if at some day they said I should be a dean, which won't happen, but th then I guess, I mean, there are, I'm sure there are deans here. Then I'd start pushing down on the system and probably get lots of enemies. But for now, I maneuver and I, I feel like I make a difference from my own perch. So that's just my individual response to your question from my narrow lens. Okay, all right, you did all right. You okay, okay. was that okay to answer that it's, one? It's, it's good enough, <laughs> yeah. Um, so Speciosa, maybe I would want to turn to you with, with this question uh, from Diana about whether we're leveraging our, our influencers. It made me think of a democratic proposition, right? So public health has a superior democratic but unorganized base, and it goes up against specialized interests. So as a politician, I wanted to ask you for ideas about how we might better leverage that inherent advantage but organizational challenge. You know, ever since I joined politics, every time people say, we are not in the police arena, I say, join politics. I think that, uh, <laughs> When we get more of you joining politics, then you'll be at the table. This is what it means. It means getting organized as a political economists and fielding candidates at the relevant positions 
where your influence will actually be actualized. And I have seen this happen. Because of uh, issues of uh, health, and since I joined the Ministry of Health, I've been telling doctors, join politics, and actually now we have quite a, a good contingent of uh, doctors in parliament, but do they understand political economy? They just understand I go there okay, to make the laws. So I think that is also an arena which is very useful. Yesterday we were launching a book for our former chief justice. And uh, I told uh, the, the, the very eminent persons who were there, I say, please give us members of parliament who have the metal, who can understand that every aspect, every sector matters. But when they come into parliament, they should be able to be open and really know that this is what we should do. And Michael knows I keep going back to the community. Because if the communities are not able to input into the election process, their own manifesto, and also walk through that with the people they elect, then you will not be able to get these politicians actually understand that they are there as agents of the people through politics. And therefore, because of politics, politics must continue to matter. Because really, being at that table in cabinet, in parliament, when it's passing the budgets, people don't understand they are passing budgets for, for, for things like hospitals and whatever, when 75% of diseases are preventable. Because we, we should really say the real issue is, and it has been mentioned before, who finances, who pays the piper to produce papers which turn our heads away from what should happen? Who finances, who, who, who pays the lobbyists in the policy process in America? Who pays them? Because all policies, whatever of whatever nature, and that is what political economy is all about, matter in the health and well-being of people. Whether it's the gun policy, whether it's policy on where hospitals are built, whether it's policy on what type of roads, whether all these ones matter for people's health. And uh, I would really, because sometimes you, you have school of public health and you, you, you bring up these ideas on the little political economy, which Michael put in my head, because I had to do anthropology, I had to do ethics, I had to do all that. And uh, to what extent? are they actually influencing what happens on the ground? And how many of you professors follow up your students of political economy to see what influence or impact they are having on, the, on, on, on where they work? And this is where Michael really does a wonderful job of it. He follows everybody up. You are there, a doctoral student. He wants to know what you are doing. And he's on your toes. You don't respond. He will go to WhatsApp. He will send you an email. <laughs> <laughs> he will send you students to follow you up, students in the classes. And this is how we build the family of political economists out in the field where people are. Because it's very easy to be in the university and you teach these things. But the practice is very different. It's really very difficult to convince people. So the more you have at the policy table, in parliament, in government, in these institutions which make change, I think we, should, we shall make a, a difference. And in Uganda, I'll tell you the policy on gender. You put somebody there to be vice president and a woman, and she's compassionate about inequality and inequity. Compassion also matters, because you may be a professor, but your students don't see compassion in what you are doing. You just give them all these theories, the theories, they pass the papers, 
but they don't go away with that uh, passion which Michael has. And I'll tell you, those of us from Africa who have been Michael's students, we've taken away his passion. And many have joined politics. Many are activists through the NGOs, through research institutions. So to me, that gap between policymakers... Sorry, Special, so we're, we're out of time here. Uh, so yes, I, I appreciate that passion. The gap is through participation. Uh, we have to wrap up. We got a coffee break staring at us. Um, I'm sorry to the other panelists. We we, we didn't we didn't get to uh, for for a last reaction. But I'll close with another Michael story, uh, which is in the early '90s. He and Mark Roberts looked around the School of Public Health and said, "There has to be a way to unite all these pieces. There must be something that ties the school together." And this would be a, a search for an additional leg. The one they really wanted was history. But they didn't have anybody who knew that history, and so they went to ethics instead. So the third leg, which should be there, was ethics. The fourth leg, uh, according to those scholars some 30 years ago, uh, that would be history, an answer we can all, we can all get behind. So <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you to the panelists.
If you could please find your seats, we're just about to start our next panel. Thank you. Okay, we'll just give it a minute. Get everybody situated on stage. They'll come back. I think people may wander around, but hopefully they'll come back. <laughs> yep. So is my mic live? Okay, welcome back everyone to the last panel for this afternoon. <laughs> My name is Prashant Yadav and I'm a senior fellow here at the Center for Global Development. I work on healthcare product markets and supply chains. I will introduce my esteemed panelists in just a minute. I want to start with uh, my Michael Reich story, which is um, about 15 years ago, I was an engineer trying to use tools of system dynamics, system science to solve healthcare supply chain issues in multiple countries. And I was getting super excited about you know, building these simulation models and trying a lot of operational research things. And somebody introduced me to Michael. And uh, 15, 16 years ago, I sat in Michael's office and I was telling him stories about Oh, what I thought were great ways to fix healthcare supply chains in country A and country B. And the hallmark of a great teacher, uh, Michael sat, listened to me intently, patiently, uh, did not say anything. And he said, that's very interesting. And then he gave me two things. He gave me a little CD with a, 
with a software called Polymap, and he gave me an article from, not the entire book yet, but an article from the Green Book. And the reason I'm saying that's the hallmark of a good teacher is to understand the mental model of the student. Here was a young engineer type who was trying to use little tools of mathematical simulation, who had never taken a class in political science in his entire academic career. So instead of trying to convince that students to, to very quickly jump to political science, Michael thought, let me start with polymap. This kid seems to like these software technology types of things. Maybe he will get excited by it, and then he will come back to me, and then I will have a longer discussion with him about political economy, supply chains, accountability, utilitarianism versus deontology, what is your right objective function, what are your control knobs, and that's what started my discussion with Michael. Soon the access uh, book was published, Michael gave me a copy, Laura and Michael uh, were you know, very kind, and then over the years, that's the book, if you haven't seen it. Um, and I, over numerous cohorts of my students, who were all business students, I teach at a business school, I was teaching at a business or an engineering school for the most part, I had my uh, cohorts and cohorts of students read the book, and the exercise I used to give them was, this has six case studies, find more. They can be the six case studies of the health technologies that are in Laura and Michael's book, find more, and I would send, if somebody really wrote a good one, I would send them to Michael and say, this, this student may have done a good one. Um, so anyway, in the process, I learned a lot. Um, I realized that my technical tools of doing system dynamics and, and little simulation models were not sufficing. Uh, when I was having discussions with leaders in the health sector, they were looking at me like, I don't necessarily connect with you, but over time as I acquired these new skills of the political economy of the healthcare supply chain, suddenly I became somebody that every permanent secretary thought, you, I think you understand where my challenges lie. So I owe a lot to Michael Reich. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> One of the things the, the framework in the Access book talks about is architecture. So oftentimes what we find is that when we're thinking about access to health technologies, we can solve for availability, but that hurts us on affordability. We solve for affordability, that hurts us on adaptability, right? So these trade-offs are the part which are most complex. And the, the best part about the framework in the Access book is it very clearly and vividly describes the need for the architecture layer on top of these availability, affordability, adaptability uh, things. And it essentially talks about architecture as uh, friction and trade-off resolving entity or institution. And oftentimes we've thought about architecture to be something which is global, supranational. Uh, that's what will allow us to solve this. And many of the examples in the book indeed are about the architecture sitting at a global level, you know, partnership between a global pharmaceutical company uh, and a purchaser and so on. Uh, but we are going to go first to Amy Nunn. Amy is a professor in the School of Public Health at Brown University, and she's also a professor in the School of Medicine. She's a former doctoral student who's worked with Michael uh, and has worked on some of what we've discussed earlier today extensively. So the first question I want to pose to you, Amy, is architecture at a national level, not at the supranational level, not in Geneva, Washington, but can a country truly develop a better architecture for access. You've done work in Brazil in the early days of HIV and ARV access. What does it mean when a country thinks about access, defining an architecture for access at the national level? And a second follow-on question I want to pose to you is, we often talk about low and middle income countries, but the access to health technologies problem is as vivid and clear in high income countries. You also do work domestically here in the US where we see this very clearly. So also tell us, are they similar? Are they very different when you think about the two? And I know you have to go soon to catch a flight, so therefore I'm posing both my questions to you and then we'll have ample time afterwards. So Amy Nen. Great, and I think I have some slides. Uh, and while they pull up my slides, I just wanna read. Of course, I'm very disorganized. I submitted my contribution late, but I'm gonna squeeze it in, my contribution 
about how Michael touched my career, and it's, I'm going to get to your question. It's related to that. I'm just going to read it while I pull up my slides. <clears throat> Michael Reich's contributions to global health have been remarkable by any measure. Perhaps most noteworthy are his impacts on training countless numbers of global health scholars and helping them become the best version of themselves through his unparalleled commitments to mentoring. I'm fortunate to count myself as one of the many people Michael has mentored over the years. When I was a doctoral student at the Harvard School of Public Health, I always felt a little bit like a fish out of water, a girl from Arkansas lost in Boston. I never really fit in and was overwhelmed <clears throat> with how difficult all of the academic assignments were. I literally couldn't do any of the epidemiology or biostatistics assignments. <laughs> I didn't understand what was happening all around me in the quantitative classes. One professor even told me that I should not be at Harvard. <laughs> My father called that Preparation H. Uh -huh. <laughs> but Michael saw something in me and cultivated my talents when others gave up on me. He knew I understood public policy and ethnography. He leaned into mentoring me. This started when I was a master's degree student and he thought I had a good idea about looking at decentralization of reproductive health services in Brazil. When I was doing my master's thesis, he supported my work with, the, with a fellowship. When I discovered how much Brazil was spending on HIV medications, I was shocked and immediately shared it with him. He encouraged me to keep poking around. Then when I came back to Boston, I shared with him all I'd learned and he helped me apply for three more fellowships. He must have written me 50 letters of recommendation over the years, and that's not an exaggeration. He began pushing opportunities my way whenever possible. When I presented a really ambitious doctoral thesis idea, others were really skeptical. Michael, on the other hand, was intrigued and encouraged me to take on the larger project. I plotted along learning Portuguese and doing a lot of historical archival research and over 100 qualitative interviews. Others told me I was taking too long and that the scope of my project was too ambitious. Somehow, Michael was always in my corner, gently nudging me along with encouragement and fending off all of the skeptics. He knew I was on to something. When I got back from my field work, he told me that I had enough material for a book and that I needed to publish it quickly. He introduced me up to a publishing house that took a lot of interest in my book and he kept telling me, Amy, you need to keep going. This is an important story and you have to tell it. Again, others were skeptical and he told me, and told me, academics say this kind of thing all the time, books don't count towards your scholarly contributions. He knew that was silly and that the story needed to be told, and he told me to write the book. At the end of the day, I ended up publishing all of my work, including a book about the politics and history of AIDS treatment in Brazil. He line edited the entire thesis, which later became the book, and without him, it never would have been possible, and the Brazil HIV story might not have ever been told. Eventually, the book was very favorably reviewed in The Lancet, even though they said it was plottingly written. <laughs> Michael took a gamble on me when others wouldn't and spent countless hours line editing my dissertation drafts even when I was rather defensive about all of his really constructive feedback. I was too young to know not to be defensive. Now I know time is love. What greater commitment to someone than to spend so much time with them? All of that was lost on me then. In my late 20s, I didn't realize he was making me. He also helped me become a good interdisciplinary scientist and a good writer. Indeed, he's always with me, with me when I write, and with me during my field work, even after all these years. I think perhaps most noteworthy was how he always modeled important leadership behaviors. He told me how to, he taught me how to mentor others by modeling it and cultivating me when others had given up on me. He never insisted on co-authoring any of my papers, even when other people did. Simply put, he always did the right thing. Oftentimes now, when I'm confronted with ethical dilemmas about scholarship, fieldwork, or ethical dilemmas, doing research about the world's most vulnerable people, he's always with me. I often ask myself, what would Michael do? And the path becomes clear. Thank you, Michael, for making me. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Your so, slides and I'm going to be, um, I am going to talk about science. So, um, <laughs> so I just want to show you guys, I, I, like I said, I'm really an ethnographer at heart. And uh, I just went to Brazil. Most of my work now is in the U.S. But 
Brazil is still in my heart. And here's a picture um, uh, of Public Health Triumph in Brazil. Um, if you want to know how we got to this, this is a picture of an STD, an LGBTQ clinic in Brazil that has a whole lot of antiretroviral medications in the closet, um, which is really exciting because uh, 20 years ago, our policy that was institutionalized globally and in the United States uh, was to let people die because it was too expensive to treat people living with HIV at the time, which was unethical, um, human rights violation, and completely outrageous. But we institutionalized that with policies in the United States in the late 90s. And then we compelled other countries to do that through abusive foreign aid programs. Brazil changed the dialogue by challenging multinational pharmaceutical companies about outrageous drug prices and then threatening to produce generic medications and then inducing big pharma to reduce their prices. So this is a big architecture. This is, I'm answering your question finally, um, um, story. And, and now, um, when you go into Brazil's public clinics, this is what you see. Um, and these, do you know how much these pills are worth in Brazil? They're, these are generics, by the way. They're like $3 a bottle. Um, and in the United States, we still have huge access. Um, and so I'm going to show you like pictures from Brazil. This was March uh, when I was there recently. These are my colleagues that run a big PrEP program um, in Salvador. PrEP is one pill once a day that can arrest HIV transmission for people who don't know. Um, it has almost no side effects and it reduces the chances that people who are HIV negative um, uh, contract HIV to almost zero. So it's, it's a public health miracle by any measure, but many, many people who need this medication can't get access to it. Brazil really changed the global health landscape um, by proving this was possible. Um, and also that induced major reductions around the world in, um, in pharmaceutical policy. Now, fast forward to 2022, next slide. I do a lot of work about PrEP and access to pre-exposure prophylaxis here in the United States. We've got a huge problem with access to medications here. Um, I don't want to paint a, a, uh, an idealistic view of what the health system is like in Brazil. There are a lot of challenges but they've done a lot of things right. Um, here in the US, we still have big problems um, with access to pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, medications. <clears throat> this is a three-site study that we did. It's an NIH R01 um, observational cohort. And we found that only about half of people who initiate PrEP in the United States in three kind of diverse clinics around the country um, are enroll or stay on a, a PrEP. Um, and we couldn't really tell you why. This was an observational cohort with no intervention. And so um, then we wrote a few more grants to study what was going on. And I love qualitative work, so I always want to talk to our patients and our clients. So we did a qualitative study to ask why. Um, next slide. And what we found out was uh, there are lots of different opportunities for disengagement from the healthcare system. So we published uh, a framework. We talked a lot about frameworks today. Um, I do a lot of clinical work now. And this is a framework that we developed to try to think through what are the health system structures or the social and uh, behavioral factors and also the health system factors that can influence whether or not someone actually stays on PrEP. So we published this in um, AIDS in um, 2017. And this is a, a framework that's commonly used to measure country or clinic progress um, and patient progress through what we call the continuum of PrEP care. And um, the thing that stuck out most to me with the ethnography is the these are all opportunities for people to continue in care or to disengage. The most important point that we have found where people disengage is at the pharmacy point of sale. Um, and that is because people experience exorbitant co-payments and deductibles when they go to the pharmacy. We may not even know at the clinic level that they have fallen out of care because what happens oftentimes is that people go to pick up their medications and the pharmacist says, you have a $350 copay for your PrEP medicine. Remember the one in Brazil that's $2? In the U.S., that's $1,600 to $1,800 a month. 
And so a lot of people, most people who take PrEP are well. They're not sick, right? They're trying not to contract HIV. So one of the things that happens <clears throat> is that they, they get hit with a big copayment or deductible at the pharmacy, and we never see them again. And this is a huge public health problem. And we have had several people, I, I run an LGBTQ clinic now, we've had several people who experienced that who then subse subsequently contracted HIV. Um, that's unconscionable. That shouldn't be happening in a, in a, in a health care system um, like ours, where we have such high quality services. So next slide. One of the, we decided that we were gonna have a look at this on a mega scale. I'm terrified of quantitative data analysis, as I mentioned. All my professors identified that very early um, <laughs> during the course of my professional development, but I work with a lot of really smart people who understand math. <laughs> and um, one of our trainees who's now at Hopkins <clears throat> led this analysis with pharmacy claims data looking at this phenomenon at the pharmacy point of sale across the whole U.S. So we bought a pharmacy claim set with about, data set with about 60,000 patient, unique patients in it, where we looked at this phenomenon at the, at the pharmacy point of sale. Um, this is kind of a diagram of the, it's one of those flow charts that may not make any sense, but it, 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 it um, basically illustrates where, how and why people fall out at the pharmacy point of sale. And um, we believe that most of this is due to exorbitant copayments that are associated with really high costs of medications for our nation's most vulnerable people. Most of the people that need PrEP in the United States are African American or Latino and are at the low end of the income spectrum and they fall out at the pharmacy point of sale because their health care is not good enough because they don't, their health insurance doesn't cover enough of their, um, of their medications costs. And this is the first study that actually linked that phenomenon to, to increase rates of HIV. So people who experience those, uh, who fall out of care at the pharmacy, have three times the rate of HIV infection as those who don't. So this points to a really important um, health sector opportunity to intervene. I personally believe that we should be doing a whole lot more with the private sector and a whole lot more with patients and pharmacists and insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies actually at the pharmacy point of sale. Um, huge public health opportunity to intervene and address those things. Um, and um, this is an example of small tweaks in our healthcare system that could conceivably um, have a really big impact. Um, in Brazil, a lot of times, um, you don't even have to go to the pharmacy. You just get your medications right there when you go, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to your clinic or to your doctor. Um, there have been a lot of other really innovative um, um, movements around the world to intervene at pharmacies, and I think um, we could do a lot better with that here in the United States, and this is an example of, of um, how we, of, I think true team science, you know, we had a claims analyst, we had an epidemiologist, we had me, an ethnographer, or whatever I am, and, um, and also a geospatial epidemiologist who then took this and mapped this. There are a lot of um, geographic disparities uh, associated with these phenomena as well, but um, certainly an interesting finding and I think an interesting opportunity um, to improve patient care outside of uh, the clinical care system, but within um, the private sector or the health, um, the health system in the U.S. Thank you, Amy. I know you have to go and catch a plane to Thank go you. home to your family, so we'll excuse you. Thanks for your Thank you. Thank comments you so and remarks. <laughs> okay. Next, we have Jeff Mikowski. Jeff is the secretary of the HBI Institute. He is formerly the vice president of the International Trachoma Initiative. He was a ch uh, chair of the steering committee of the META, of uh, the Medicine Transparency Alliance. Uh, has worked across both public and private sector uh, with pharmaceutical companies, public-private partnerships in the area of access to health technologies. Jeff, first of all, welcome. Thank you. Traveling here from Berlin. Um, public-private partnerships, pharmaceutical companies, and the, the nature of um, partnerships for access they have created. It's an area that many people in this room have studied. Michael has studied them, written about them, analyzed them. Are we making progress 
Are there areas which are understudied in how those partnerships can be more meaningful and successful? Are there areas where we are sluggish and not moving forward from the trachoma initiative till more recent partnerships, including for COVID vaccines and COVID health technologies? Where do you think the field stands? Where should young scholars focus their energy, ingenuity, and creativity? Great. Um, thank you very much. Um, first off, I'd like to say I'm delighted to be here. This reminds me a little bit of the Global Symposium for Health System Research, but with a more select group, but it's like a big reunion. On that front, um, I remember when Michael was awarded the Sam Ajay Medal in Vancouver, and he noted in his Russian kind of way that it's for service, Jeff, not for results. <laughs> On this occasion, however, <laughs> I think the results, the influence Michael's had has become abundantly clear to all of us. And so it's a great pleasure to be here and I'm glad I could make it. Um, so I've got a couple different comments to make in response to my charge. Um, one is we're living in circumstances where there's now distributed authority and distributed legitimacy across different actors. It's interesting that the kinds of standard approaches we once had about legitimacy and authority are gone, for better or for worse. And that's reflected in sort of the post-critical, critical, critical analysis and in a range of things, the efforts to decolonize public health and so forth. So it's just to note that that is part of the backdrop of where we're working. Um, are we making progress? I think in a number of ways we are making progress. If I look at the trachoma program, they recently celebrated their billionth treatment delivered, which is pretty impressive in the course of 20 years. Um, and with trachoma in particular, you're reaching a population that by definition is poorer, uh, has challenges in social, commercial, and other determinants of health. And so you see the burden of trachoma in the most vulnerable communities. It's worth noting as well, for those who don't know, that in the early part of the 20th century, trachoma was a leading exclusion criteria for European immigrants coming to the United States. They'd avert the eyelid. If the kid had, or the person had trachoma, they wouldn't let them in. Uh, in the UK, Moorfields Eye Hospital, which is a premier ophthalmologist institution, was developed uh, on the basis of trachoma in the soldiers coming back from the Napoleonic Wars. So part of the reason I mention that is it's something that was resonant with a number of different stakeholders in North America and Western Europe. Certain other tropical diseases or neglected tropical diseases aren't so resonant. So it's finding ways to get into people with that humility and that proposition of what works. Um, my next comment is around this question of return on investment. We talk about neglected tropical diseases as having a great social return on investment. But who captures that return? And how does that affect their behavior going forward? That's less apparent. And we're still working in a space where, frankly, the donation programs are charitable undertakings that maybe are done with personal commitment of the people involved with them in the organizations. But at the end of the day, it is whether you call it corporate social responsibility or social license to operate, it's part of what's happening there. Um, the companies are clear that they're not charitable undertakings. They're businesses and they're driven by the tyranny of a quarterly reporting cycle and those kinds of things like that. Um, in my sense of things, we have made progress. The norms have changed within the companies, so many of them understand individuals that they need to do more. Uh, again, picking on Pfizer, they pretty freely donated a fair bit of intellectual property to the patent pool uh, system and have tried to engage in other kinds of things as well. With respect to their donation of azithromycin, while the initial target was on trachoma and the elimination of blinding trachoma within a WHO uh, normative framework, uh, it's become apparent that azithromycin as a broad spectrum anti-infective has other beneficial effects for the health of children in particular, especially in high burden environments in low income countries like in Niger or in the Horn of Africa, West Africa. 
places affected by conflict and instability. Um, so what, to pull this together in the limited time I have, what I've seen is the programs that focus on specific conditions that represent a discernible change in practice seem to have more traction both with the companies and with the countries. Um, and that's fine as far as it goes. So if you look across the neglected tropical diseases, whether it's trachoma, whether it's uh, schistosomiasis, whether it's lymphatic filariasis, there are product donation programs where there's otherwise not functioning markets. And as far as they go, that's okay. Um, but the other problem we face here is how do we shift the understanding of the epidemiological transition that many low-income countries are facing and look at a different array of products that aren't a single dose of medicine once a year, but maybe daily administration or more. And, and that's a harder sell. And I think there's a lot more work to be done on what are the incentives for the companies as well as for the countries. I mean, I've just completed work on supporting the UK's pandemic prevention work in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the challenges that we have at the country level, as well as with the, the donors, as well as with the private sector, are, are not to be underestimated. So we need to understand better what kinds of incentives can shift behavior and what kind of incentives can provoke better social outcomes that are still consistent with the company's core business of fulfilling its profit targets and that kind of thing. Um, so I think there's been progress. I think there's a lot more to be done. And as we look to the future, we need to look at what kinds of things are on the horizon. How do we anticipate them? And what are the ways we can look at finding either medications or programs that can get these things into the markets and hopefully into the supply chains that deliver them to the people who need them? So there's some promise there, but there's a big unfulfilled agenda. So let me stop there so that Wilbur can counterpoint. Thank you, Jeff. So on NTDs, on acute infectious diseases where a single pill can, can uh, be used, we are making progress. Where, where we come to NCDs, where we come to chronic care, we still haven't truly made as much progress. You know, models of tiered pricing, voluntary licensing, many tools that we all at CGD also have researched and written about. That's where we haven't necessarily gone as far as, as we ought to, and new models need to be looked at and, and perhaps evaluated there. Okay, that's wonderful. Uh, with that, I want to go to Wilbert. So Wilbert Bannenberg is, uh, we all know him from HERA, so he's a public health consultant at HERA, but he's also uh, the chair of the Pharmaceutical Accountability Foundation, something that he has created, um, a long time, um, long time expert in the area of pharmaceutical procurement, transparency, health systems, many, many uh, different areas that I have come across, Wilbert, in my, my own work. So first of all, welcome. Thank you for making the trip. I want to start by asking, we, we titled this session as Politics, Market, and Institutions, and that is in a way very representative of the kind of work that Michael has done, not just on access to health technologies, but his broader work on politics and public health. We've seen a challenging last three years. Some would say commendable progress in both developing new health technologies so quickly, and also I think my colleagues Amanda and others did a paper which showed that this was still the fastest that we could get health technologies to people in LMICs from the time they were first authorized at a stringent regulatory authority in a high income country. So yes, we did not meet equity goals, but still we were as compared to a counterfactual of any time in the, in the history, we did very well. Now, counterfactual of some time in the history isn't the best counterfactual. We ought to do better, and we can't compare it to just some you know, hypothetical counterfactual in that sense. So uh, your views on politics, markets, and institutions, and access to health technologies, what we've lived through during the pandemic, um, good and the bad and the ugly that we saw. Um, and then that will open us up for a discussion from everyone as to where we think we need to advance more with research, thinking, new frameworks, and so on. So, Wilbert. Thank you, <coughs> Prashant. Yeah, first uh, one, one session about Michael. Huh? Sure. So, <coughs> okay. 
he wrote this book. Yeah, and uh, by chance I had also done this already for many years, and so I thought this is interesting. And when I had the opportunity to attend the flagship course, I learned uh, all these models, uh, including the framework that's in here. And I thought, well, that looks like what we had been doing more or less, but yeah, we could do better. And always when we had to ask, when he asked what, 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 what should we do, he said, why, why, why? So you have to ask everything, every time, why I've been doing this, and then again, why again, and then why again. And um, that is uh, together with Mark Roberts. Unfortunately, he's late, but uh, we together we had then three, uh, two flagship courses specifically <laughs> on the pharmaceutical uh, uh, reform uh, in Jordan and in, uh, in Cape Town. So I'm not sure which one you like more. Anyway. Um, I took a lesson also there, because in the framework of the regulation, I took the regulation as the one that I think I should work on. So the last five years after I stopped doing uh, consulting uh, as HERA, uh, I actually now in the Pharmaceutical Accountability Foundation, and we want to actually regulate the system better so that we actually have pharmaceutical companies more adhere to their human rights uh, responsibilities. Uh, so, um, uh, a quick back one on, on Brazil. Uh, Amy was in Brazil. Uh, we, I was in South Africa. We had uh, 1,500 people getting infected every day and 1,000 people die every day of HIV AIDS. We had court cases with the industry. They wanted to stop us uh, temper with the intellectual property rights. Uh, I worked for Dover Cho. I had to reduce the price. Uh, the price was $7,000 per person, and uh, I calculated quickly that 7,000 times 3 million people infected is 21 billion. And Thabo Mbeki said, no way, <laughs> he's an economist. Um, the, the thing is that after we won actually the court cases, industry gave up its court case to stop, we still didn't make progress because uh, we had a health minister who was actually unwilling to actually treat. She was believing in garlic and African potato and so on. And it took three years, which means three times 200,000 unnecessary deaths before we could start treatment. And the way we achieved the treatment was by convincing Thabo Mbeki, who is an economist, that it was cheaper to treat people and let them live than to let them die and pay funeral benefits to the widows. Think about it, mm. yeah? Uh, we had to wait until the minister was not in the cabinet session that week, so uh, otherwise she would have created a problem. But then we started treating. Now we have uh, 6.2 million people on treatment in South Africa. So, um, <coughs> yeah, what is the the, the COVID uh, experience? Um, yeah, it was really politics was yeah it was very bad actually from the rich countries. The rich countries actually paid a lot of money, I think in total 93 billion, for uh, the industry to actually make this all happen fast. They bought up all the production. They, 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 they bought all the drugs already. They bought six times too much uh, in Europe to be sure that we got all the, all the vaccines. But they did not actually sell the drug companies while we buying this drug from you that you also have to give a fair share to the LMICs. So, in fact, by the hoarding that uh, the rich countries did, uh, the, the, the low middle income countries actually went uh, late. And uh, there is a slide in the thing. Uh, what we did during Corona, we monitored uh, all the people, all the companies developing uh, a, uh, a Corona vaccine or therapeutic. <coughs> how was their, how good was their human rights uh, practice. So we had 19 criteria, we scored them all. And uh, yeah, you see there's a few green ones, uh, then a few yellow, that is uh, 50 to 60 percent, but Pfizer only just scored 50 percent with Moderna. And then there's a whole lot of red ones, even worse. And the problem was definitely that uh, the rich countries could have actually done something better by telling the companies to actually do better in this, uh, because uh, we worked very hard to actually we knew we had a production problem in the first year. Big Pharma could not produce enough. There was much more capacity in low and middle income countries, but we didn't actually, the drug companies didn't win, want to give the transfer of technology to those 
where the production capacities were bigger. Anyway, so the, both the governments and the industry were actually uh, failing us, I think, a little bit. Now, we we're lucky that uh, uh, Africa protected itself a little bit and the epidemic wasn't so bad there, and then we had uh, variants that weren't so, effect so, so, so lethal, but anyway. The markets also failed. I mean, the markets didn't really solve this problem uh, of the capacity, because uh, and there was no willingness to share. That was the World Health Organization. Dr. Tedros asked, "Please share all your technologies in the interest of the saving the planet." But uh, the, the drug companies didn't do. They did do uh, some patents uh, sharing later with uh, the patent pool. The, and that actually is also the reason that uh, for the therapeutics, the pills that they make, they get a better score in the card than uh, for the vaccines. Well, the institutions, of course, the UN institutions, COVAX, they all tried and failed, but th they, they, they could not actually get enough uh, actually product to actually uh, uh, yeah, help uh, in the beginning to have an equitable share. Uh, after the first year and after the second year, it gets got a lot better, but uh, not uh, in the first year. And I think that's where the problem is. And the, the analysis I made, why, 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 was definitely that uh, this was still business as usual, whereas we had hoped that in a pandemic, if you want to save the planet, then you should actually do something different. So what do we need to do? Of course, we need a global strategy. And to answer the first question to Amy that she didn't answer, uh, uh, at country level, you need a national medicines policy. And at global level, we probably need a global compact for uh, how we are going to de deal with this issue. And Double Show technically can do it, but the countries let to ha have Double Show their way. For that reason, we have uh, a need for a pandemic treaty, which is being negotiated very hard. And it also the debate is going again about the IP issues and so on. So the industry is still trying to protect its long-term interests. Uh, I would like to protect the people's interest and the human rights, uh, so on. So, okay, the next pandemic is not yet here. L let's hope it is going to be two or three years more before H5N1 comes. Uh, in the meantime, we need to monitor and evaluate what uh, everybody is doing. And I think the pharmaceutical companies definitely uh, could be monitored using their human rights uh, responsibilities a bit more. The states have the obligation to actually make sure that people have access have to medicine, but uh, the, the industry who has then the, often the monopolies and who has the po possibilities to make sure it goes to the patients, they actually can ask super high prices or actually restrict uh, access and, and so on. So I think there is a need to actually have that debate about uh, human rights access uh, and so on. So the <coughs> trans this access in the future will not be possible without transparency. The transparency that's needed on uh, the R&D costs, on the production costs, uh, the profits. There is a definition of the would show now called fair medicine price. It is the cost plus method plus the fair profit. You can negotiate with this fair profit. When I, uh, when I recently in court said 25%, then some industry applauded that I was so high. And Apvi, who made 78% profit, of course didn't like the idea because they're making 53% excess profit, which is globally $110 billion, by the way, on product called Humira. Uh, the transparency will have to be legally enforceable, possible, otherwise, uh, it won't happen. There is guidelines uh, or even a resolution from the World Health Assembly, but uh, only Italy so far has actually implemented that. In, uh, and I think uh, uh, legally enforced transparency would definitely uh, do much better. Then we need the fair pricing. Now, okay, the fair pricing, uh, how we agree there, how we get there is by making a kind of rules about what drug companies have to give to uh, HDA bodies during the reimbursement uh, in the reimbursement dossier. Uh, we are going to pilot uh, this test uh, in the Netherlands if we can actually get this done. And the final one is that this, uh, human rights, uh, the duty of care for, uh, for drug companies, which they accept that they have to adhere to the principles and 
according to World Health Organization, they have to uh, also have some responsibilities, but we want it to be a legally enforceable uh, action, which actually is supported by the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises already for 10 years. And that's what we're now trying to put into law in se several European countries, including the Netherlands. So, so <coughs> well, uh, you can invite me again when the next epidemic uh, or next pandemic is coming, but hopefully we can actually avoid uh, the issue. And so to, I'm speaking now to the next generation. We've worked a long time to get all these access to medicines. I mean, when I started, there were two billion people on the planet without access. There's still two billion people without access, yeah? So we can actually do better. Uh, okay, on the other side, the glass is half full. Uh, those, when I started, two billion with access, and now it is five billion with access. So that has improved, yeah? So, but I mean, still the two billion without access is still enough to actually keep studying the book and the, and the framework that uh, Mark has, Michael has written. Super, Wilbur. So before getting into the content of what you said, which I have lots of viewpoints on as a moderator, I won't necessarily bring out my viewpoints. I don't necessarily agree with all of the points made here, but I think the, the, the thing that you said about the three, three whys um, reminds us that Michael is a very interdisciplinary researcher. He pulls things from various disciplines. So think of it as in the 60s, 70s, when the Toyota Motor Company was systematically using the three Ys and building the Ishikawa diagrams, Michael uses the Ishikawa from that Toyota tradition and applies it to studying health systems and, and so on. So uh, very interesting that you imbibe the three Ys and have used it. Um, on this topic of why didn't we do so well, what could have done what could have been better? Is it about companies sharing their intellectual property? Is it more about tech transfer? Is it about know-how? Were there sites that could make biologics? Because we did have very good tech transfer happen for the small molecule uh, therapeutics and so on. I mean, we can have a longer debate uh, as to whether it was firms in the market that weren't playing the role? Was it purchasers in the market who weren't playing the role? What nexus of actors in the market and institutions were not coming together in the right way that led to what we experienced? So that's a topic of longer debate. I think I'm sure people here have different viewpoints. and uh, But that's not where I want to focus the rest of our discussion, because that's a debate that can happen for hours and hours together. Uh, what I want to, to do is invite people here in the room, questions, comments, things that you want to highlight about access to health technologies and where you think we need to focus our attention more as a scholarly communi community, as a practice community, as people who care deeply about public health, which depends very intricately on access to health technologies. Uh, where is it that our efforts are not converging sufficiently. What should we do more? Uh, that's what I think I would love to hear your thoughts, comments, viewpoints, perspectives on. So, Susan. Thank you for the discussion. So, I'm speaking from a, a, my wearing my health financing hat now, and so. Just to say the discussion going on right now within uh, the health financing community is out-of-pocket spending, catastrophic spending, so the UHC indicator around this is not improving, right? If anything, we're seeing it, it worsening. A and we know that the, a large, large driver of this relates to out-of-pocket spending on, on medicines. And we know that, and this is a big topic for research in terms of which types of medicines, et cetera, you can unpack that question, but I thought I'd take this opportunity while I have this group here because um, we are, so I sit in WHO, and we're having the discussions with our medicines colleagues about what's the entry point. So is it really, as Amy is saying, is it the co-payment deductible, so is the entry point through the health financing system, um, or is it how, is it related to the pharmaceutical industry, and the market and, and the profit-related incentives. And of course, I understand it, it's both. Um, 
but where would you place your, your emphasis in terms of entry points to, to really get at this very quite intractable um, issue? Thanks. Thanks, Susan. We'll take two more, and then we'll, we'll address all three in a batch. So any other comments, questions? Yes. Um, I, I would like to um, invite us to, to also question what are the technologies and the medicines that we want people um, to have access to instead of um, sometimes falling into um, the influence of the promoters of these new technologies and drugs and then using us to improve the access to something that maybe is not that useful and is very expensive. Thank you. Here at CGD, we love that question. I'm saying here at the Center for Global Development, we love that question that you posed. Yes. Hi, th my name is Yolini. Thank you very much for this great discussion. I was particularly interested about the inequalities in, in the delivery of back COVID-19 vaccines. And I think one of um, your question about um, where we failed, um, because for me, I, I see it every single part of the value chain from the, the amazing speed at which we were able to develop such um, technology. We failed at every single stage as a global community and as a public health community on the equity dimension. Um, and for me, at that last step of in-country delivery, really, really highlighted the, the pr profound inequalities in delivery at country level, at local level, the failure to institutionalize community health workers, and the real cornerstone of, of primary health care. And I, I feel that this, uh, the lessons learned from the pandemic, um, we really need to, as a community, of, of scholars here need to dissect that and understand that so that we don't, um, we, we learn from this and we don't make the same mistakes again. Okay, wonderful. So we'll take those three questions. Um, let me just say one word about what Susan said and then I'll come to you with, with those questions. So I think in an, in an environment with either flat or decreasing health sector budget in a very constrained fiscal space for health sector spending, the first area that is unlikely in most cases to get any expanded allocation would be medicines. I mean, no one wants to cut doctors' salaries because Michael has taught me this, that from a political economy standpoint will be a very poor decision for a health minister to make because doctors not getting paid salaries would show up on newspapers. Medicines, we've anyways had stock outs. We've anyways have been relying on out of pocket. So people will say, sure, yeah, we are not doing better, but we are at least not doing worse than before. So the likelihood that we will have more spending to reduce out of pocket on medicines looks a little bit grim, um, but we should, we should still figure out what's the entry point. And I think I like your question in the sense that, yes, it's not that we can fix the out-of-pocket problem completely, but what is our entry point? Where could we make some meaningful difference, even in a constrained uh, fiscal environment? So with that, let's first start with the question that Susan has posed, which is entry point in reducing out-of-pocket or managing out-of-pocket, however you want to think about it. I'll go to Jeff and then to Bulbert. For out-of-pocket, it's, it's clear it's in the financing space and how health services are funded. And as you say, there's constraints there, especially in low middle income countries already. I mean, doctor salaries in Egypt, in Tanzania, in Ghana are, are terrible. And most people take second jobs and other ways to augment their lifestyles. So I think the financing point is one, but it needs a really sober reflection under the circumstances. Wilbert. Well, <clears throat> we have to look at the architecture first. So what are we, what, what do we want? We want a system that is Solidarity, uh, all people have the same chances, yeah, whether you're poor or rich. But then also, if, uh, if you are uh, in a, a person that has uh, sex with other men, men having sex with men, how do you say this, LBTQA or, uh, sorry, 
uh, when you need, when you're more at exposed at, at risk of infection with uh, HIV and you need PrEP, then it's very important to also know how much does that drug cost. Yeah, so in <coughs> if it's in the US, $1,800 per month, what I hear. In Holland, it's 50 euros. Yeah, and it's the same product we're getting. And there's generics as well. So the question is definitely uh, that also, uh, uh, yeah, co-payments should actually, in, in my point of view, not be there. I mean, if you need a chronic disease drug, you need to actually be exempted from co-payments. And the system, I, I find it totally uncomprehensible how the US works in its system. But in the Netherlands, you just go to your GP or to the health offices and you get registered in this program and you get the drugs for free. I mean, that is how it should be, I think. But even within Europe, we have countries that, that do it differently. It has to do with the way how we use the patents. After the patent expires, you can get a supplementary protection certificate. So in some countries, uh, like in Belgium, the price is much higher. It's about 400 because they actually did have the patent still on the on the drug. And in Germany, uh, that was for some time as well, but then there was a constitutional challenge that this was unconstitutional to have uh, this uh, extension, so the price dropped again. So there are, there are ways to turn the regulatory jobs, the, the, the knob, to actually make sure that uh, you can guarantee as a kind of uh, organizer of the system that uh, people have access, but yeah. Um, and then I think in principle, you have, as a patient, you have the right to health and the right to a medicine. So I'm surprised that there is no revolution in the US yet about mm -hmm. people having to mortgage the houses uh, because they can't afford cancer treatment. I mean, s sounds crazy. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Michael again. <laughs> <laughs> so um, at the same time, there is some meaningful progress in the US. Yeah. We, have, we can negotiate. I mean, some of our government purchases have first time gotten the ability to negotiate yeah. prices now. We have some privately run initiatives happening which are looking at retail prices out of pocket. So there's also some glimmer of hope um, in, in our health system here in the US. OK, so the second question was about access not just to any health technology, but access to health technologies which are truly cost effective, improve. Um, health outcomes, and that's essentially a question about are we in the architecture, whether at the global, supranational level, national level, in some cases, subnational level, embedding cost effectiveness analyses, health technology assessment effectively. Uh, we like to think that, yes, we are making progress, you know, both at the supranational, and national, in some cases, subnational level. But if you have ideas on what more can be done so that it's not just access to anything, it is access to things, it, technologies which really are going to have health outcome improvement. So any quick reactions and comments? We are uh, running out of time. Jeff, I'll go to you. Yeah, um, and there, there is some positive movement at the Pan-African Regula Medicines Regulatory Agency. It's early days. Its full scope of work will be negotiated politically, and we'll see where that takes us. But there's some promising hope there. But it's so distance yeah. to go. My answer would be there is some medicines are more important than others. So World Health Organization since 77 has the essential medicines concept. Mm. In the past, it was only the cheap drugs there. But since 2000, with the HIV AIDS crisis in South Africa, we put now all the drugs that really work and that we need in there, even if they are patented or very expensive. Now there's about 90 drugs on the essential model, model essential drug list. OK, so my answer should be uh, make sure that uh, Every country has to have its own essential medicines list. In the Netherlands, we have a very large list. Uh, I mean, you can imagine that a country with less resources has only 400 on it. Uh, Veronica has calculated that with the Essential Medicines uh, Lancet Commission, it cost only $13 to $25 per person <coughs> in this planet to give everybody access. This is only 11% of what we spent in the world on, on medicines. So let's just get the politicians uh, uh, to realize that and, and, and stop in, yeah, buying or spending money on drugs that are marginally effective or marginally cost effective. And let's give the priority first to the drugs that are really important. So, Okay, wonderful. We have, a, I think, a, just a couple of minutes left. 
So your question is such that I don't think we'll be able to get to in the one and a half minutes left, but I, I want to say one thing, which is, yes, across the value chain, we have had challenges. But to think about this from the lens of political economy, one aspect that we sometimes forget is a health sector leader in a country, minister, secretary, permanent secretary, cabinet secretary, whatever is the right rank, is answerable to their constituents as to why can't they get them access to COVID-related health technologies. They are the ones who have to answer to both the head of state and to parliamentarians and to constituents. But their agency to change something from a supranational architecture is almost non-existent. And that is a structure that we've got to change. Muhammad isn't here, but yeah, I hope Kalechi will, will go and change this in some meaningful way where the, the, those who are answerable to their constituents are the ones who should have agency to, to make sure that they have access, not just some committee that decides what products, how much, to whom, because that political economy will continue to fail. It will not generate the right kind of accountability for any such uh, institutional structure. But I want to give both of my panelists 30 seconds to say closing remarks uh, on anything that you like, and then we will close our session. So I'll start in the reverse order. Wilbert mm. first. All the next generation students learn about the concepts of essential medicines, the book. Uh, make sure you understand that this is an important framework that is still valid. It's even valid in the high income countries. And uh, yeah, practice it. The World Health Organization is a bit uh, taken, uh, is doing other things. And <laughs> if you're not actually, uh, from a scientific perspective, actually defend that some medicines are more important than others, then we won't get there. Because remember, the two billion, I'm stopping at my career. It's your job now to save those two billion to get them access to medicines. Yeah. Jeff. And my closing salvo is, there are risks, but there's an opportunity with the increased attention on health security related pandemic preparedness issues. And if we're really moving towards integrating those functions within the health system, much as say emergency obstetric care was integrated in the health system 25 years ago ish, um, there's an opportunity there. And we, it's at our own peril that we don't take advantage of it. My 10 seconds is Michael has taught us that political economy is extremely important for access to health technologies. We can't solve it with technical solutions. We can't solve it with my little models from before. Uh, we need political economy lenses to it. And second, uh, he's also shown us the path of pragmatism and, and shown us that in order to do this, we, we have to think about this with a pragmatic lens. And those two together, I think, will help us in defining the right architecture, in ri defining the right partnership and the institutional structures for improving access to health technologies. Thank you, Michael. Thank you to my panelists. Th Amy has left. Thank you to you. Thank you. Thank you. a video tribute that many of you have contributed to. So Jonathan. Hi, everyone. Um, so if I could read uh, Michael's uh, mind, it will be like, keep it short. So I will just keep it short. Uh, this is a video that we uh, made with Veronica, like as the director, producers, uh, acting pretty much like uh, all the crew of a documentary that was a mini documentary on Michael's achievement, Michael's uh, impact. Uh, so we had the opportunity to talk with uh, more than 30 people uh, with 25 videos uh, that we had a uh, really difficult time to making sure to have the best 
and the most impactful uh, mentions uh, about Michael's life and Michael's career. So I just want to introduce the, the video to you. Michael, you are one of the most original and influential global health thinkers of our generation. I first met Michael when I was a student at the Harvard School of Public Health in the late 1980s. Back then, Michael was an associate professor of international health in the Department of Health Policy and Management. And he was already the executive director of the school's famous Takemi program in international health, which he had helped establish in 1983 and would soon take over as the director. His contributions to the field have improved people's lives in many ways. Michael, when we met 40 years ago in New Delhi, it was clear you had the vision, the energy, and the passion to transform the field of health policy, research, training, and teaching. Michael was so knowledgeable. Michael was about transcending boundaries and specialties. Dr. Reich has dedicated decades to investigating the inequities in health services around the globe, to understanding the intersection between healthcare and policy, and advocating to improve healthcare outcomes for underserved communities all around the world. It's wonderful to get to be part of this celebration of his work, which has made such remarkable, path-breaking um, impact on our understanding of health systems, how they work, why they often don't work, and how to make them stronger and to sustain them and to make them work on behalf of health equity. I remember your early contributions to the political mapping of health policies, which, as you know, I applied explicitly to the health reforms I had the honor to lead in Mexico. One of the most important contributions, I think, that Michael made in the ethics uh, section in that course, which he worked on with, uh, with Mar Mark Roberts, um, that, I think, is an important and unusual contribution to how to think about health reform, one that emphasized thinking about the complex and different ways people systematize their values and how to use that in an understanding of how to make good arguments for the kind of policies that we think we should do. You develop the access plan for patients affected by Chagas disease, that's what we are using to help them today. He's one of the few people I've met in my academic life who is such a intellectual of wide breadth, unbelievable reading. Whenever I speak with Michael, it always seems that he's read just about everything. I've always had trouble suggesting new readings to him. I think Michael corrupted me by showing me the political economy of healthcare and um, introducing me to different ways of thinking about health reform. It gave me a framework to shape and think through, you know, public health in, in general and was probably one of the most useful tools I had um, when I began my public health um, journey. One of the first classes that I took on global health and research design, and it fundamentally changed the way that I critically think about research concepts within a global context. I learned that although his questions can be uh, very direct, they're usually very uh, on point and they're also incredibly helpful. Um, and so over the years, I had the opportunity, um, first as a, a master's student and later as a doctoral student, to uh, have these sessions with Michael, where uh, he would uh, 
read something I had written and again, ask the same questions. How? Why? And how do you know this to be true? Um, and those, those questions have always stuck with me and, and have, I think, really helped me to become a better researcher. Your clarity, your abhorrence of jargon, and your quickly coming to what is the question and why do we care has influenced so many of us of how we think of the politics of health and health systems and health reform. That course was one of the highlights of my doctoral program. And for me, it sort of emphasizes that in addition to building a, a methodological core in terms of skills and you know understanding a specific field and really well through a, a good PhD, you also learn to think. As we all know, Michael has a gift, not only for thinking critically about complex policy problems, but also an unparalleled talent for guiding those of us who are committed to finding solutions. What has set you apart from all other visionaries has been your generosity in supporting others and your dedication to mentoring. This dedication has been the hallmark of your leadership of the Takeme program and all our collaboration. When I talk about him, I always mention that Dr. Michael Reyes is like my academic dad. What's funny is that even now, working together two decades later, at a time when by many metrics, I'm a bona fide grown up. Still, when I send to you some pre-read material in advance of our meetings, it feels to me like I'm preparing homework to turn in. And then I wait with bated breath your reaction to it, which is basically the equivalent of my grade. I feel really lucky and really privileged um, to be able to call um, Professor Reich, you know, a mentor, um, a senior colleague um, who I look up to um, in, in my professional career. Thank you very much for all these years of teaching, of inspiring. Thank you for all that you did to help me get here. Um, not just intellectually, but also just to believe in myself and know that I could go and do big things. Help me gain trust in my own voice, in my own ideas, and for that I'm eternally grateful. Michael has been a constant presence in the careers of generations of public health practitioners, an encouraging and supporting presence, I would say, always convening, always welcoming at Harvard and conference venues all over the world. His attitude, his generous attitude has generated a profound sense of community. Something I really like and admire from you is your passion for public health, for research and your discipline and the, the way you work, you work so hard uh, to really make an impact and a contribution to our fields. We all know you are a rock star. You're brilliant, but you're also a warm and caring person who treats people with respect. And those two things don't always go together in our world. So super grateful for this as a model to colleagues and to students alike. It's, it's hard to, to serve as both a mentor and a friend, but he has the unique personality that allows him to be just that. Um, with inspirational intelligence and an incredible warmth and sense of humor. There is one thing, a, a great memory I have in my mind, and is that when we were receiving the diploma of the, of the Takemi Fellowship Ceremony, my mom was there. She traveled all the way from Colombia. And I remember that he did a special translation in Spanish to her and gave a, a, a very motivational speech while I was kind of like walking to to give him a big hug, and I will never forget that. You you know that's that's makes that makes me very emotional because besides being a mentor, a, a great leader, a real professor, he's a great human being. Podría hablar horas acerca de sus cualidades intelectuales, pero quería centrarme en este hecho tan importante para un ser humano, el de su generoso corazón. El de su bondad sin límites, de su solidaridad sin ninguna distinción. I hope we continue to work together for 
years to come. And I'm super appreciative of the outputs and the simple joy of doing public health together with you. Uh, it's my pleasure to very warmly congratulate Professor Michael Wright on this great celebration of the impact he has made in global health international all around the world. Michael, a professor, el mejor profesor. Um, congratulations on this recognition for your outstanding work at a global scale throughout so, so many years. Your research, your teaching, your knowledge uh, has just been uh, such an incredible contribution for the global health space. Michael, now as you embark on a new phase of your life and work, I am very eager to see what new paths you will carve. I wish you and your family, your terrific family, happiness and joy always in all ways. Best congratulations to you. We have not only received uh, a, a videos from so many of you, we have also received a lot of notes and photos and we would like to uh, give this to Michael as a memory book. So together with the video, lots of photos and notes and thank everybody who has contributed. I think we had over 50 people, so 25 videos which we incorporated and 23 notes. Thank you very much everybody and Michael this is for you. <laughs> So is it my turn now? <laughs> Five minutes. So I, you know, um, it's been a long day. Thank you all who are here for staying this long. Thank you everyone online. Um, I wanted to send out, if, if she is still watching, my 101-year-old mother is watching from her home. Uh, <coughs> well, with my sister and her husband. So um, one of the things that I learned from Harvey Feinberg, who we heard first thing this morning, was um, don't, at the end of the day, stand too long between your hungry audience and the reception. Um, so l let me just make um, a few, a few uh, comments. I, I, of course, have comments on every panel <laughs> and a comments on every presentation uh, and, and on every uh, moderator, starting with Harvey's own comments and corrections, but we'll leave those aside. You know, um, the let me make one comment about models since we spend a fair amount of time in the day talking about models and frameworks. Wh wh why do we have models? There actually is in the Boston Children's Museum a room on models. Models of uh, trucks and cars, models of how waves occur, okay? Models are human creations that simplify reality so that we can think about them systematically. And uh, as Andrea pointed out to me, talking about three-legged stools <laughs> and, and you know it actually guy it's pretty stable <laughs> okay so and 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 it's something <laughs> and it's something we've returned to a lot um, in a lot of discussions you know what is a good model 
One thing that is a good model is something that sticks, that you return to, that seems to make sense for certain purposes. Um, even if Dai would like to have a fourth leg or 135 legs. Um, and, and, and so let's not kick out the good models unless we have something better. Okay? Sec <laughs> and we can talk about that. Second comment, you know, um, this has been such a wonderful day. And, and each one of you, I mean, we could, we could have gone on much longer. Um, and, I, and I really do want to hear what you're doing and what you're thinking about and what you're working on and where your life is. Um, the, I, I, one of my reflections is who are we? other than sort of, you know, friends of Michael. And, and, and whether there is some we here that goes beyond today. And I leave that simply as a question mark to think about. Um, I wanted to leave you with, since, since today has been partly about ideas and partly about Michael, the person, um, I wanted to leave you at least m with some of my own reflections on Michael the person, um, which since everyone else has talked about him, you know, <laughs> why not me? <laughs> um, and, and I've been thinking about this a long time. I've been thinking about this the last, you know, at least the last several weeks. You know, the, the sort of drivers of Michael, of me, and, and sort of important threads and, um, uh, and, and, and I never started out with this intention. So each one of you where I had a relationship on some project or uh, some thesis like Amy, um, it, was, uh, it was focused on that connection, the ideas and the person together as a package. And it was not intended to string all of you together in this setting. And um, the, the things that, at least in my mind, I think motivated me were um, finding a good puzzle. You know, what's, what's the question that you want to work on? And, and what's a, what is a good question, both ethically, um, intellectually, something worth working on, which is a, it's an art choice. And, and the second part is um, learning. And, and for me, it's always been a question of, well, what can I learn here? I mean, not consciously, but it's the finding the learning opportunity that is helpful for the pe person I'm working with and for me. That each, each encounter is really an opportunity for learning um, and, and where it takes me and where it takes you is, is not entirely clear and not entirely known, um, but in some sense giving you the opportunity to also learn and change yourself. And my role is partly, as, um, as Karen said, you know, asking the questions to get someone to self-reflect and learn. So, um, I'm not going to give any substantive comments on all of the things that have been discussed. I do want to thank all of you here for uh, spending the time here again. Thank Amanda CGD for being the host. Um, thank uh, Veronica, where are you? Veronica, who has been the, she has had her hand on the rudder of this ship uh, from the beginning and keeping us all on track and uh, everyone involved, um, Prashant and Jesse, for your uh, wonderful management of the panels and the people. Um, let, let, me just, let me just conclude by saying that um, just, just so that you don't get the um, wrong impression um, that, that I am still working. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And, and if you ask my wife, she says, I'm working more than ever. Uh, anyone who, who, who wonders what has changed is my contractual relationship with that institution in Boston has changed, but what I'm doing substantively has not significantly changed. Um, and I look forward uh, to continue working with and learning from all of you as well. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's been a remarkable trip so far, and I look forward to more opportunities of working with you as we move into the future. Thank <laughs> you.